unless you are fully clothed. Okay. Um, because we are going live, I'll take it a little bit every time just before a particular section of the uh, agenda to explain things out there further. But first of all, can we just pop around and do a self-introduction? Um, beginning with you, Hillary. Hillary. She's muted. I'll I'm unmute muted. all. <laughs> all unmuted for a minute. Hillary, Hillary Councillor Dunedin Ward. Michael Deeker. <clears throat> yes, hello everybody. Michael Deeker, up the road from Hillary, um, Dunedin Ward. Uh, yep, ordinary old councillor. Alexa. Hello, Alexa Forbes, uh, Queenstown Lakes District um, uh, representative or Dunstan representative, ORC. And I'm Marion Hobbs, I'm chair of the ORC in Dunedin constituency, and that's the local train going past. Sorry. Carmen, are you there? Don't think she is. Gary? Hello, Gary Kelleher, Dunstan constituency. Welcome back, Gary, and I thank hope you. you will. All good, thank you. Thank you. Michael Laws? Kevin? Yeah, Kevin Malcolm, Moriki constituency, ORC councillor. <clears throat> Thanks, darling. Andrew? Andrew Noon, Dunedin constituency. Thank you, Gretchen? Kia ora, Gretchen Robertson, uh, Dunedin constituency. Thank you, dear Brian. Kia ora, yeah, Brian Scott, councillor, Dunedin constituency. Kate? Hi, uh, Molyneux constituency. And because this is the strategy and planning group, or I'm sorry if I've got its name wrong, we have two other very special members. Edward. Uh, kia ora, Marian, koutou koutou, Edward Allison, iwi representative. And Lynette. Kia ora koutou, Lynn Carter, iwi representative. Okay, darlings, now people, if you're watching, you'll see a lot of other wonderful odds and sods. I'll explain their attendance at various times. I'm sorry, staff, for calling you odds and sods. And, and the lovely, um, what's his name, Alec Neal. Okay, before I go much further, we the agenda for us today is, whoops, and I've just lost my agenda. The agenda for the day begins with, um, a report from the Money Hero Reference Group. And then we're going to go, these are the major parts of the agenda. Then we're going to go to an approach for the development of a new land and water plan. And it's about how we do this. Then we're going to take a break because last time we, I noticed, well, I was fairly tired by the end and I think we need a break. And then uh, for about a quarter of an hour, and then we're going into some matters for noting and there are reports on the Resource Management Amendment Bill, which is making its way through the House at the moment, the MFE release on fresh water, and the interesting stuff on three waters investigation. And we'll just report on those things. There are papers there, but um, actually have a discussion on them. We hope to end the meeting at about four. So if I go back to the agenda, that's all acceptable to people? Yep. Yes. Yep. I'm just going to mute you all. Whoops. Um, and then we're going to, there's no one as a play, a played for conflict of interest. I don't think this is anything on here that affects any ownership of anybody. Public forum. There have been none, no calls to public forum. Have there, Liz? No, um, no ma'am. Is I'm sorry to interrupt, but is Councillor Hope on? I can't. I thought your number was. No, that was Councillor Laws. Oh, Councillor Laws has just come on. Welcome, Michael, on by phone. Um, um, I think I don't know if you're talking to me, but I'm only hearing every second word. Okay, love. I'll try and be very precise in a minute. Um, and Thank you. So, so therefore we now come to item six of the agenda, which is a presentation. And you find this people, if you haven't, I hope you have, by going into um, our diligence and in the resource center, it's under the workshop and, me and meetings presentation. So if you'd like to go and find that, that would be useful. Workshop. Could, could you put it on the screen? Somebody put it on the screen or? 
That would be wonderful. I can't. Can somebody else? Tom will do it. Thank you, Tom. So you go to Resource Centre and you'll find it. Oh, for God's sake. Sorry, that's just me swearing. It's here now. It's on screen. All right. Thanks, Tom. Okay. How I suggest that we do it is that um, I leave it open to you two people and welcome particularly to Alec Neal and to, I've just lost you, the other person, because I've lost everybody. <laughs> Andrew Newman. Andrew. Andrew Newman, thank you. Um, can you two take it away and explain? Trying to keep it tight. We will. Marion, can you hear me? I can, Alec, I can. Thank you, thank dear. You. Thank you for the opportunity. And yes, uh, we will be brief. Hey, look, our team was set up specifically um, to look at the issue of the Manaharakia. And um, we have been working diligently for some months in that regard. Hey, this is a matter which has actually been on the council agenda for some considerable time. It's a priority catchment. And uh, as you are all aware, it was addressed back in 1991 when the Planning and Development Select Committee considered um, the RMA, the Manaharakia um, was grandfathered because of the deemed permits. And for 30 years, um, they had time to work through how they would convert those deemed permits into resource consents. At that time, no one believed that uh, 30 years would be too long, um, but unfortunately it has come up to bite us on the buttocks and uh, next year, uh, the time expires uh, for the deemed permit and they need to be converted to resource consents. Hey, look, I'm the independent chair and uh, my job is to corral uh, our various uh, fine members uh, to try to achieve the goal, which we are looking at. Um, and look, at this stage, we've had good cooperation and collaboration between the members. There's been robust debate, and I say robust because it has been, where there are such diverse groupings. Um, but I believe that we can reach a possible consensus. And um, if we do so, um, it looks as if there will need to be compromise from time to time, and that's compromise on all sides. So look, our role is to provide you, the ORC, with a preferred water management strategy, and regulatory rules, limits, and targets for the Manaharakia, and that's our intention to do that, and we hope that it'll be a template or blueprint for future uh, water allocations uh, around the Otago region. So look, uh, that's my introduction. I'm gonna hand it over to Andrew, who will address you on how we hope to achieve this end and how we hope to report to you in the foreseeable future. So Thanks, uh, Marian, Thanks, that's me. Yep. Ma Marian, Michael here. Can I ask Alec a question before Andrew carries on? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. I'm very, very pleased, Alec, that you took on the job of that independent chairmanship. Thank you for that from me. Uh, as independent chair, have you taken the opportunity to be in touch with the various groups represented on the reference group to assess their level of satisfaction with whether they're being heard, whether their opinions are being noted and listened to? Are they all happy with the process. Can you answer that? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, the answer is uh, almost after every meeting and during the lunch break, I circulate and talk to individual members or individual groupings. Um, I've had a number of uh, communications from individual groupings uh, about their specific concerns. Um, yes, like any group which is diverse as we are, uh, there are differences of opinion, but at this point, um, I'm not aware of anyone um, that has such strong views um, that they don't wish to proceed anymore. Um, look, Graham Martin, as you know, was a member of our group and has retired. He did that on his own volition, but he was sort of part of the farmers group. 
um, but he indicated that he didn't feel that he could make further contribution and he isn't with us. Um, but other than that, look, we are working constructively, even if we have differences of opinion. And remember that as an independent chair, I have no opinion. <laughs> Thanks, Alec. I really appreciate that. That sounds like a very thorough job. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I go back up then to, to Andrew, please? Thanks, uh, Marion. And um, I'll, just, I'll just rattle through this uh, presentation quickly. Sorry if uh, whoever's in charge of the presentation. Yeah, so, so really the purpose of this um, is to give you a framework for questions as much as anything. Um, so I'm just going to talk a wee bit about, well, our work's really covered purpose, so I'll move on from that. Um, I just want to talk briefly about the context uh, uh, for manicure care. Um, then, then the reason why we've got a reference group and a technical advisor group, um, so that's, that's reasonably important to clarify that. Um, talk a wee bit about the plan development method and timing. Uh, uh, I've, I've listed another point there, which is what I call an analytical framework, which is fundamental to getting some, some decision-making done uh, and progress and insights. Uh, and um, I'm assuming that, that most people have read the briefing note that accompanied this presentation, which is in a whole lot more detail. Um, Thank you. It was good. Yeah, great. Okay. So next slide, if I can, Liz or whoever's in charge. Um, Tom, thanks. Um, the MRG members requested that Alec and I update the Council on the Purpose, Approach and Progress with the Man Here Care. And we that was probably largely because particularly in the new triennium, there hadn't been this opportunity. So this is the first time for the, for the council's new triennium that we, we're able to do this. Um, and look, to be fair, Alec and I have just provided a bit of interpretive commentary and I've had input from members of the team, including Tom, uh, Rachel Brown um, and others as well in this process. So it's been a team effort. Uh, thanks, next slide, thank you. Next slide. Okay. Look, Matt, it's, it's suffice to say for anybody, and I'm sure you all do know Manihira Care to a greater or lesser degree, but f fundamentally um, solving water management issues in the Manihira Care is complex. And, and I've got a reasonable amount of experience in this sort of stuff. Uh, and I'd rate uh, Manihira Care as one of the more complicated catchments um, and freshwater management challenges in the country. Um, just for a variety of things that I've listed and a fair bit of detail on the briefing note. Um, and that means there are multiple issues and challenges to be addressed across what I've called all of the well-beings in the Local Government Act context. It's any time that the council ultimately regulates around fresh water, it's gonna have an impact that, that crosses those well-beings. So that's, that's, uh, that's relevant. Uh, and um, the final point I make there is that the challenge for change um, in water management, and that is definitely coming, um, is going to fall largely on the current generation living within the catchment. So it's, it's, it's really pretty central to how people within the catchment, either using water in a consumptive sense or and or um, just living within the catchment, see and think and feel about this issue. It's, it's, it's a large crunch coming on this generation. I just wanted to reinforce that. Okay, so... Um, next slide, thanks. Oh, shall I do it? No, it's happened. It's happened. Okay. Yeah, just why, why the MRG? Um, well, it's a bit of a long saga. Alec referred to the fact that you've had, we've all had 30 years to deal with team permits. Um, and look, look, to be fair in many here at Kia, there's been a decade of work undertaken on trying to resolve water management issues, actually. The, the, so there was activity, substantial activity, uh, um, lined up and progressing well ahead of the deemed permit um, expiry date. Um, but but I'm just, I'll just be upfront about this. I think both the community and ORC at various times in that in that 10 year period have lost connection with each other. Um, don't need to go into whys and wherefores and fault, but it's just, a, I think that is a reality. Um, the second point I make there is that uh, the community itself has got an intimate knowledge of water management issues. Uh, and within their catchment, and it's specific to the long history and extent of catchment modification, which is major. Uh, and and my, my, ju my judgment and others is that if, if ORC is going to ult ultimately arrive at a point where it's got a robust regulatory framework, um, then, it, then it needs to tap um, the community's knowledge around water use, water management, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's, it's complicated. 
and we need to, a relationship with those who understand understand how it works currently. Um, similarly, the water users um, need a broad community and stakeholder mandate for their continued water use, and and a, a, a critically a mandate if they're gonna, if we're going to produce uh, progress future management options. And I'll come back to that point a bit later. Um, so, so the, the real underlying thread here is that everybody in this journey is in it together, um, really. And, and the only way it'll be solved sustainably in a, in, in a, in a long-term sense is that by maintaining that process. Okay, so next slide, thank you, Tom. Uh, so this is just, a, I, I'll really rattle over this. Uh, we're on a journey here. It's, it's been, it, it's sort of, it's, it's, it's progressing. Um, the reference group was set up in, in uh, 2019 alongside a technical advisory group. Uh, and um, really, we've, the, the group's been meeting on a monthly basis uh, since September of 2019. There's been a fair bit of input work done. And what I mean by that is every, every participant's had an opportunity to talk about their values and aspirations for the catchment. Uh, and that complements work that was done by the um, ORC planning team around community consultation and value setting. Um, there's the, the values and aspirations work's been mapped in a report drafted that's in the public domain, I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, so that's an ORC report. Um, we've, we're, in February, the MRG consolidated some principles and the scope for the plan development. That, that mm -hmm. The scope in particular remains a work in progress because that interfaces with the wider land and water plan, clearly. Uh, March, June, I've expanded that um, uh, time frame simply because given we're in this COVID scenario with lockdown, um, we, we're unable to meet face to face, which means we're doing Zoom things like this meeting, and that means that um, we just need a bit more time to get stuff sorted out. Um, but what we've called narrative objectives for scenarios, that's the underlying bottom lines, it's a work in progress at the moment. April, July, um, we're going to run a scenario process, um, and then July, uh, we're proposing that um, probably be towards the end of July that, that the, the scenarios for water management within the catchment will be drafted into a document we'll call Manuhira Care, Care Choices. And that will become an, inf an informal consultation document for the community um, to, to really say, well, okay, if, if there's a flow regime of X or a flow regime of Y, this is what it means for us, this is what it means for the environment. Uh, and um, these are some of the things that we're going to need to consider about future management and future regulation. Uh, then, um, really, from September, November, September and November, we're looking to get the plan drafting complete. So that means that you'd end up with a preferred scenario. Um, which can, I, can you just hold it right there, love? Yep. Is that the plan drafting we're talking about? Is your FMU? For the land yeah. and water plan. Yeah, that's that's correct, Marion. And, and that's that's right. And so so if I just take you quickly back up to principles and scope for plan development, um, this is why I'm saying it's a fairly iterative process between the land and water plan scope and the more detailed work being done in Manihira Kia. They both they both need to align, obviously, clearly, and that's an order of process. Um, but fundamentally, what we're trying to do is, if you think of it like a funnel, we're trying to say to the MRG and ultimately to the community, here's, some, here, here's a framework for looking at um, how water management might take place and, and bottom lines and regulation and limits and minimum flows, all that sort of stuff. Here's what it means for you in a scenario sense um, and, and the pros and cons, et cetera. And ultimately, MRG, if it does its job well, will come back and, and, and give yourselves as ORC councils in this committee and the Tangata Whenua reps a, a view on what would be potentially the preferred plan trajectory okay, out of that process. And really what we, we're, we're saying is that to try and keep within the, the, in the December timeframe the completion of this chapter for this ROPI we need to be into plan drafting by September through November. Um, so that's the sort of logic to it, I guess, Marin, if that helps. Okay. Right. And to be really clear for people, there wouldn't be submissions of this or even our approval of the plan until we do the whole plan. 
No, well, it's, that's that's your process. What we're trying to do is just is just get the, get our recommendation from this process to you yep. um, in that time frame. Because the reality is, I guess, if you go back to your land and water plan, you've got a whole lot of other catchments to deal with. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Uh, now, now, just um, I might move on. To, sorry, the the other thing I'll refer to on this slide. I'll be really quick. Is we have what we're building an what I call an analytical framework for the scenarios that includes hydrology. Uh, we need cultural assessment work done. Um, we are obviously working on uh, understanding habitat and ecological values. Um, and we're also building a framework for being able to understand uh, different flow regimes, minimum flows, water allocation regimes, and their impact on farm systems, which then starts to aggregate into a socioeconomic analysis. So that work is underway. Um, that is that is really fundamental ultimately to enabling an informed conversation for MRG and ultimately for the community about the pros and cons of various plan options. Okay. So I'll just carry on from there. Thanks, Tom. Uh, just finally, final slide, um, progress and insights. Um, to, to confirm what Alec noted for you, we have made steady progress and the debate's been respectful and constructive actually. Um, but there's definitely debate there. Um, the robust analytical framework, which I referred to is critical to the success of this exercise. And we, we should have that up and running by, the, by July. Um, in terms of judgment, access or not to water for consumptive purposes is the most complex, complex challenge for the men here here. There are other elements of planning framework which are not as complex as that, that is complex. Um, the flow scenarios we run will be assessed from a naturalized state to current state and points in between. Um, our observation, and this is partially my experience coming to play here, is that the current water management system, including infrastructure within the catchment, is a capacity and it, from what I can see, lacks what I'd say is resilience in the long run. Um, and that's more laid out in a wee bit more detail in that briefing note that I gave you. Um, and look, a plan which changes the status quo um, of current water use uh, and management within the catchment um, will require a debate on how to solve the conflicts, the related conflicts, and they're going to be one well and truly there. And um, I think ORC is going to have to have a, a, a discussion about what is this role in this respect. In other words, you're going to have to go further, if I can be a bit direct, then mm -hmm. simply considering a plan to considering all of the other issues associated with the Local Government Act well-being, and what do you do about that and what's your role in that. Um, just, to, just to be direct, that, that one's coming. It's not the... <laughs> it, it, right, so that's, I think that's the presentation, um, everybody. And it's okay, better... On, that, on yeah. that last point, Andrew, are you talking investment? Well, potentially, Michael, but I think you can go through a process of defining your role in, in that process. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not giving you an absolute steer saying you need to invest as a, as a, as a council per se. It's, it's an, an option. Um, and if you go there, there are a variety of ways of doing it, and you probably wouldn't do it on your own. But what I am saying is that if, if I'm up front with you, I think uh, fundamentally, if you looked at a combination of more water to the environment, uh, and climate change, climate change already evident and, and, and coming in the next 30, 20, 30 year period. The fact that the catchment's massively modified relies on infrastructure today, that infrastructure's old, uh, actually a lot of it's very old, um, then, then all of those issues are gonna be really relevant to wherever the plan change process ends up uh, and are gonna require some resolution. You know, there's, there's no way out of that probably. But ORC is just going to have to think through what its role is specifically. Andrew, can I just do a processing for a minute? Yeah. People, I can't get the full screen yet. Can we take the um, shared screen off, please, so I can see everybody? Thank you. Right. I've got Kate and I've got Hillary. Kate. Thank you. Um, that's great. Thank you, Andrew and Alec. Um, just wondering, um, Talk about climate change and this when you're developing the scenarios that leads yep. into the Manuheta care choices. Uh, uh, two questions with that is how you're modeling 
climate change and what it might look like because it may have peaks of rain and yeah. very long dry periods and and how you're putting it into those choices yeah and so the next question I, was yeah i've got one other after that yeah fine so to really quickly answer that what what we've commissioned NIWA to do as part of a hydrological modeling framework is run a set of climate change scenarios um, as part of the, as part of that hydrology assessment now, now that, that will be broader than just Manihiriki, or I should flag that as well. In other words, if you looked at inland montane sort of Otago, Upper Tairi, Manihiriki, et cetera, those climate change scenarios will be relevant to that part of Otago. Um, the second point I'd make, and I think this is reasonably evident, is, is, that, is that the amount of snowpack storage within that part of Otago is probably going to diminish. Um, you'll have higher precipitation, more rainfall, more, more, not necessarily more rainfall in quantity, but it'll be more rainfall than snowpack melt. Um, and so those things are all going to lead to, to understand to, to having to figure out, well, what do you do about storage, actually? Um, that dynamics changing. So that's what I expect to emerge out of that climate change stuff. But it's fundamental. To do that, if you're thinking about infrastructure, which has got a long run life life period of say three, four generations. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Your second question. Second question is it? Um, it's an ec ecological one, and what I'm and it's a question I've got for later in later parts of the uh, meeting is understanding the indigenous versus um, non-indigenous freshwater um, ec ecologies. And what priority we're giving to each? I know the RMA under section six and seven give more weight to indigenous, but I don't see that coming through as um, a value thing here. And often they're in conflict. Uh, so, yes. So, so Kate, uh, what we have done, and we're in a we're in the middle of a conversation around it actually within the MRG is uh, in what we've called the narrative objectives discussion, yep. uh, which is which is not concluded. It's in, it's in progress. Uh, we're into exactly that issue. That, that is one of the key issues that we're into. And there's a debate going around the MRG about that very issue. But um, suffice to say is that um, it is part of the process and uh, the indigenous ecological, rather aquatic values with the many heritage of the as we all know are very high. Uh, yep. And there's been some pretty good dialogue, dare I say, between if I'm up front between, say, Fish and Game and, and other members of the group around, well, what do you do about... Um, uh, game species versus indigenous species issues, all part of it. It's definitely there, right? I'm not saying we've got a conclusion to it, but it's, it's on the way. And, and you must also be aware, Kate, that there is uh, environment court uh, decision or decisions or decision that specifically has addressed this in recent times in the Otago region. So yep. uh, there's some issues there that need to be addressed as well. Great. No, that's good. That's good, healthy stuff. Thank you. So I've got Hillary, then I've got Andrew, then I've got Edward. I see um, that the idea is partly that this wonderful work you've been doing provides a template for possibly other Rohail or areas in general. Uh, is that work interacting at the moment or do we wait for December when you come out with a plan and then Try and try and match it with other rohos that we're running out of time by then to start from scratch. Or how do we how do we use the wonderful work you're yeah. doing to spread it out across the others and, uh, and so, uh, so we can get them all going. So, so uh, if you're happy, uh, Alec, I might have a little crack at that. Um, yep. The the what I would say is, uh, and I'm going to feel free to chip in too because Gwyneth and I have had a lot of chats about this, haven't we, Gwyneth? Um, the, the, look, Manihiriki is complicated and, and it's got a lot of history and it needs this level of, it needs, in our ju my judgment, I guess, and others, it needs this level of, of, uh, of stakeholder engagement. That's not probably true for every every Rohi or catchment in Otago. That'd be the first point I'll make. What I would say, though, is is that, so an example would probably be Tyree and particularly Upper Tyree. If, you know, I think there's a level of complexity in there that's going to need this at least some of this type of uh, framework to help. Uh, and um, it's, it's probably back in Gwyneth's court more than mine yeah. to say, what are you going to do about it? 
Um, but I do think that the, the underlying framework we're building here, both at an engagement level and also what I've called that analytical framework for scenarios, um, should be upliftable and, move, and able to be moved into other catchments or raw heat relatively readily. That's where it's been well and truly. Um, Can I bring Gwyneth up, please, darling? Gwyneth. Yep, I was just going to say um, the paper we'll be discussing later is, is basically an outcome of, uh, of our discussions um, and how work's been undertaken in not only the Manahirika, um, Manahirika but the map catchments generally. Um, and that's what's, I guess, led to um, the proposal around the overarching um, process and governance for the whole land and wa um, water plan. That also being said, though, at a staff level, obviously, we have staff working directly on the map catchments and we'd see those learnings applying directly across and that's both in policy but also in science. So science, there's been a lot of discussion um, around some particularly things like hydrological modelling and how that can be transferred across um, to other um, FMUs and what we can um, utilise and leverage off the work already done in Manahirikia. Thanks, Gwyneth. Um, can I now call on Andrew Noon? Andrew, you're a member of this group, aren't you? That's correct, Madam Chair, and I'm not going to, uh, well, hopefully not steal your thunder, but I just really want to acknowledge, um, in particular, Alec and Andrew uh, for their contribution thus far. And, uh, you know, they both talked about uh, respectful and uh, constructive dialogue. I experienced that um, for myself. There was no doubt about it. Um, and uh, the particular uh, control and, uh, I suppose, direction from both those gentlemen um, has been impressive and you know I need to acknowledge um, the other staff in and around Andrew uh, as well providing um, um, support and I need to acknowledge all, all the participants um, Kaitahu right through to uh, the local folk who have the local knowledge um, et cetera et cetera so um, in picking up on Hillary's point um, this is uh, certainly a good model um, whether it needs to be replicated um, in other catchments, well, that's another debate, and uh, it may be appropriate in some and not in others, or whatever. Uh, understand that, but um, yeah, just really want to acknowledge all uh, participants. Um, I know it's getting to the business end of this process, and there will be some really difficult uh, decisions, and I'm sure there will be intense um, discussions and debate around the MRG table. But I'm sure you, I can assure you that uh, the purpose and principles will be um, uh, adhered to and um, I'm sure that they will um, collectively as a group deliver um, a good um, direction back to uh, the planning department of the ORC. Thank you, Andrew. Edward, who is also a member of the MRG, or Naitau yep. is. Yep. Edward, can you unmute yourself, love? Where are you? Right, sorry. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify the role of Kaitahu on the MRG, we were there. Uh, from near the outset to share information and, and did participate, but it, but it became evident to us that the partnership level relationship needed to be secure at the ORC level, and that's partly reflected in the paper that follows on the land and water plan. Our experience is reference groups are good forums to share information with and develop uh, scenarios, but at the end of the day, they are unable um, to deal with uh, iwi uh, partnership matters, and so we've 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 drawn back from the MRG and have, are focusing on the mana to mana level function to ensure that that uh, partnership um, is working smoothly at the regional council level, um, we will engage as necessarily with, with the MRG. But this, is, this experience is strongly predicated on the experiences we've had in other regions with references, reference groups or zonal committees. Ultimately, they do not work for treaty partners. Understand, I think I understand. We may have to come back to that. I think, um, Edward, because it's a very serious issue. There are two questions that I have. I can't put up my own hand. So um, the first one is, will there, do you think, Andrew or Alec, will there be agreement 
read technical studies around hydrology. And the reason I have that is we're seeing it at the moment in um, COVID, particularly in the United States, but we're also seeing it here uh, in the Manuhira Kia, where there is constant argument about whose science is the correct science. It drives me dilly, but can you comment on that? Yes, yes, I can comment on that. Um, we've been through a, quite a substantial pro process to consolidate every piece of hydrological data and every hydrologist who has an opinion on manure gear into, into one tent. Um, and I was talking to Ciro just before this meeting started about that very issue. So, so what we have done is we've got a set of agreements with uh, hydrologists, including uh, Niwa and uh, the core ones are another group called Davies Ogilvy have done most of the catchment modelling over the last 10 year period. Um, those, those, those models are being aggregated into one on the advice of the technical advisory group. And not only that, we've also, uh, we've also had an agreement um, drafted between ourselves and the Manuherakia irrigator community um, as, to, as to the access to their modelling work and the use of it and also a joint process to, to verify and sort out data in flow recordings versus brass wears. I won't get, bore you with the detail, Mary, but the yeah. fundamental point is we're onto it, we're not true. Okay, then yeah. my second question goes this way. When you're talking about flow scenarios, you use the term a naturalized state. Yes, this sir. river has been unnaturalized for some 100 years. How the hell do you define? Well, well very good question, actually. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Naturalized states. <laughs> if, if you bear with me, I'll, I'll um, what, what we have done is the reason why we've got Niwa um, aggregating their modeling work with um, with Davies Ogilvy is that ne Niwa, oh, sorry, I will try and keep this really simple. Ne right. Niwa run a sort of a nationwide um, uh, rainfall modeling system called um, TopNet. It's called a virtual climate network, and it, it's then modeled into a thing called TopNet. And, and ORC is invested pretty heavily in TopNet for Manhira Kia. It is a model, um, it's not actual rainfall data. Um, it's, you know, what I would say is, is Central Otago is really short of decent high altitude rain gauges. Um, so um, the reality of having to use a modeling approach to get to the source of the truth as well as we can, it's not going to be perfect. It'll be as good, but, but I'm confident that the, the work that we do here will be as good as, as good as we can get it in terms of understanding the natural pattern. Um, it'll have a margin of error with sitting within it. Okay. And, and we'll be upfront about the margin of error and what that means. Right. Yeah. Okay, darlings, thank you for answering those questions. Are there any more questions to Alec and Andrew? And Gwyneth, I'd like to Do ask I have some phone that I can't see or hear. Carmen, yeah, uh, you got a question? No, it's, it's Councillor Deeker, I, Madam Chair. Yes, I know, darling, he's going to talk. I'm just checking. And Michael, I can't see you anywhere. Michael, have you? Is Michael still on? I'd like to ask, can you hear me? Yes, I can, dear. Yeah. Have you got a question? I'd like to ask a question. Yep, and then I'll come back to you, Michael Deeker, all right? Okay. Michael, Michael Laws. Um, the question <laughs> is, at what time do we expect to have an agreed science to do with the Manuhira Kia? When, when will we get to a position, um, trying to get nail you down to a month, when the science or the technical advisory group will have agreed what and the hydrologists within it and the climatologists within it have agreed upon the scientific framework upon which we make the policy decisions. When, when are we expecting to get that report? We're, ex we're expecting that, Michael, sitting between um, July and at the latest August. Okay. Oh, that's good. I'm going to elaborate slightly on this too, if, if you bear with me. Go for what, it. What, sorry. Um, we already have, if I, if I break apart the elements, we already have a pretty high ag level agreement within TAG around habitat and ecology. Um, in terms of the hydrology, which has been the debate point, uh, there, the, the, the modelling work that's under, you know, is effectively underway in this process to get to scenarios is, 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 there, is it's built into two phases. The first phase is to, is to have an agreed framework between the hydrologists that is robust enough for these scenarios to be developed. And that's the July at latest August issue. 
And the, the second piece that they'll do post that is that when it's when the when the um, preferred trajectory for a plan change is is, is is being developed, there'll be verification at a level of detail that's that's robust enough for our environment court hearing. Um, so that's the second phase. But you know we, we we're not far away at all from that from that point. Actually, we're we're a couple of months, two to three months. Thank you. And Mike, Michael, can I add that? Notwithstanding, there may be agreement within those uh, uh, specialists um, when it comes to a hearing and uh, later appeals. You cannot guarantee that those um, results that have been uh, agreed upon are not challenged by others outside the uh, group. Thanks, Alec. Was that what you were going to also say on natural flow? Were you going to say anything on natural flow, Alec? Oh, me? Uh, yeah. No, no, no. Uh, from 19, 1861 onwards, uh, the river has been attacked with vengeance by many. So um, your yeah. dead rock is uh, what is natural flow. Exactly. OK, can I have um, Michael Decker followed by Gretchen? Yeah, uh, a question for Andrew, <coughs> Andrew Newman um, and Alec for that matter. On a scale of one to ten, how confident are you that the December deadline will be met? Can I start uh, by saying that I consider myself to be an NZR bus. It leaves on time and it arrives on time. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. NZR buses, sometimes um, um, it's not a good analogy. Um, <laughs> very determined. I'm very determined that we reach our deadline. Um, but I am in the hands of uh, others and uh, we will push them, both Andrew and I, as hard as we can. Uh, for the NZR bus to arrive at the bus station on in December. Yeah, I'm, I'm less worried about the bus than I am about the passengers. <laughs> we all are, um, but that's my job. And if I can just add, uh, what what we are going to find is we're going to be we're going to have a very compressed conversation over a, a, probably about a two month period, I think, and that that two month period is so somewhere between July August. September around uh, the guts of this plan change. That's that's when it, that's when it's going to hit the deck. So, um, in my view, from where, where I sit today. Thank you. And the last person I had was Gretchen. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess mine was about passengers on the bus, and it's uh, wonderful to have people in the grouping and working together. But the timeline is really important. We're right down to the wire. And um, people do have a fundamental um, right, I suppose, to disagree as well, and possibly will. And um, yeah, sometimes no amount of being in the same room is going to iron everything out. And we just have to go with it, I guess, Andrew. So I can see you there nodding. Um, at some point, we're just going to have to press on make hard decisions uh, and um, yeah, we'll hear it, I guess, if people um, are still not satisfied, but I guess that is uh, a right. And I'm hearing what Tangata Whenua and what Edward has said as well. Uh, and the forum that they would like to engage in is at a partnership level and I totally respect that. So thank you for saying that as well, Edward. It's better that we understand that and that the communities understand that we have got a partnership and um, yeah, and that your views are really important in this, so thanks. Thank you, Gretchen. I can see no further hands up. Can I thank Alec and can I thank Andrew, and I think Andrew's indicating he wants to say something, um, for, um, and, and can I also thank Edward and Andrew Noon, you know, the four people on here who've been very much involved and I think Gwyneth you've been actually quite involved since your arrival on the scene uh, with this particularly uh, difficult um, reference group. So thank you. I'm just going to say Tom, to Tom who's here for the other paper and I'm not oh, sure I'm if sorry, Tom. also online for another paper both of them have been heavily involved I think in supporting Andrew. So. Thank you. Andrew did you want something further to say? I'll oh, be really quick uh, just to say that I think one of our jobs is if, 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 if the process is transparent and participants didn't agree with where it ended up, but they understood how it got there, right, 
yeah. uh, then that's an achievement. And so, so I think, and it's an important achievement. And even if the, the, there will inevitably be some debate and disagreement at the back end of this process, yeah. um, what I would say is that, that, that if we do our job well, it'll be clear as to what that disagreement is and why it's there. So okay. it won't be a surprise to anybody. Marion, Marion, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to uh, address your uh, councillors and to have a discussion and uh, set out our program. So on our behalf, thank you very, very much. Thanks, Alec. Thank you both. Um, thank you. People, we're about to move now, having received the presentation, we're about to move. There are no outstanding actions of strategy and planning. We've got the confirmation of the minutes of the 22nd of January I, can I have somebody to move? Happy to move it for you. Was that you, Carmen? It was, Madam Chair. Thanks, dear. And seconded? I've got somebody who could second these minutes. Uh, Kate Wilson. Is there any questions people would like or any things about the minutes that they worry about? They're not being so... Yes, no, no, me. <laughs> it's me. Oh, Lynette. Sorry, darling. Sorry. Um, I did attend the meeting, but I'm not listed as being there. Oh, I, I realise, but yeah. Can we fix that up, Liz? Yeah. With, with that like amendment, that. can we move that the minutes of the 22nd of January be accepted as true and accurate? All those in favour, please, please say aye. 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 And against. Anyone against, could you put your hand aye. up? Nope. You're all through. Okay. Darlings, we now move on to the next item in the agenda, which is a consider proposed approach for the development of a new land and water plan. This land and water plan is due to be done by the 31st of December, 2023. It's a wonderfully complex job. And there is, there's been a quite an extensive paper. The two people leading out in that paper have been in particular, um, Tom as the leader and Gwyneth sitting in as behind uh, general manager. How I'd like to take this people is actually move through issue by issue so that we might begin by looking at uh, the background and then the issues that you see in the paper, um, the objectives, high level principles, because the issues that we're being asked to vote on is that we receive the report and we adopt the proposed approach. Okay, we're not arguing about the science. We're looking at how it is that we're going about this. Would that be happy if we just sort of went through by issue like that? Just with yeah. questions. Yes, yeah, good. Okay. So if I look at the background, is there anything you'd like to say about that, Tom? Where are you, Tom? I can't see you for love and all money. Um, not really. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can, Liam. Um, so... The paper itself, it, it contains a number of matters uh, around, specifically around the background. We discussed the background. We also discussed scope of it, um, the purpose of the program and the objectives. I think those are matters that have been discussed in the past already. Uh, for a lot of you, those will be clear. I just thought it would be good to have them on record in the paper so that there's a, a widespread understanding and clarity about them. I think the key things uh, to me personally, that I think are worthwhile discussing um, are probably the principles for the drafting of the region-wide sections. Um, also, the, the, the plan architecture as well, recognizing that we do have, um, we're kind of constrained uh, to, a, to a large degree because uh, the architecture is to a large degree determined by the national planning standards. The process for drafting uh, the region-wide provisions and also delivering those FMU chapters and the, the proposal for a government structure itself. So I think those four uh, items are actually the critical ones. Okay, we'll take these bit by bit. Just has anybody got any questions about understanding? I think it's on paragraph eight. Um, we have to review this by November 2020, the current regional policy statement. And by December 2023, <laughs> we have to do a land and water regional plan for Otago. That includes all those things across all our ROI, across all our FMUs. The issues, as we've just had delayed to us, that's all right. I don't think there are any questions about that. So I'm looking across. Please do hands up sign people. That's the most effective and I'm 
running off two screens. Objectives. If you look at paragraph 14, we must give full effect to higher order planning documents, including the RMA, which is in the middle of change, and any relevant national policy statements. And we've got Freshwater 2017, and we've got Freshwater Current coming through. Here's my first question to you, Tom. How do we manage these unknowns outside us? I'm sorry, the railways are running quite rapidly today. <laughs> How do we manage these unknowns, mm. which are not yet actually in front of us? Yeah. Um, two things. We know that there's going to be change. Uh, that's been um, communicated to us in previous council meetings by people of the MFE who were present. And the message was basically not to wait. Just get on with it. Um, the other thing is, I think the general direction that has been set in the current NES, uh, sorry, the current NPS, uh, the draft NES and the NPS, is they've kind of given us a preview as to where we're moving into. So um, the general direction has already been set, really. Okay. Um, I don't expect a radical change at all in that regard. All right, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, may I ask a question? Yes, go for it, Deb. Thank you, Carmen. Thank you. On, just on that 14, um, that very first point uh, says, including the RMA, any relevant national policy statements. I just wanted to ask, was there any relevant national policy statements that are just specific, going to be specific to Otago for what we're doing, or not really? No. I'll answer that, love. No, because yep. they're national okay. policy statements. So yep. for, and that's the role of a regional council. Yep. We fit inside a national policy statement and adapt it to our region. Fair enough, old RMA people on the... Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Thanks, Dean. Any other questions about objectives? What about yes. the principles? Uh, paragraph 15, sorry. Yeah, go for it, Dean. Paragraph 15. Um, yeah. And it's... My concern here is actually on page 10, the, the first um, bullet point under um, under that is the OB allocation, which we know is a inflammatory, I think, statement because A, it's not defined, and B, it doesn't have an outcome that I think people understand. It's a statement, um, I'm not quite sure of why it's in there. I appreciate it's, it's dealing with the challenges and the issues and that's what it's trying to outline, but just de de determining allocation is all that is actually required in there because the allocation will be derived from those environmental outcomes that people think uh, that, that we agree to in the second bullet point. Talking about over allocation, I think, is um, inflammatory. And um, I know that there's, we heard on the 7th of January, a lot of people come along and tell us that there wasn't over allocation because it was dealt with through water um, allocation committees. And I appreciate that there may be drives for higher minimum flows and all of that, but that's actually for an ecological outcome and is, an, is the next step. And I'm just wondering why the word over is Tom, there. then Sarah. Yeah, um, I think the, currently it, the plan, um, the way the plan is written, it, it doesn't have the notion of over allocation in there. It does recognize that um, uh, some catchments might be fully allocated um, the issue is that with the allocation, we need to set the allocation limit at a point where we're still meeting our outcomes, which are defined in part by the NPSFM and also by the community. And we need to review whether the current system in the plan actually does that. So what I'm trying to say is that the current method that is in the plan to determine whether there's full allocation or whether there will be over allocation, um, setting aside the technicality, whether there's, whether that actually achieves um, meeting our NPSFM objectives. So and it's only then um, that we can define whether there is over allocation. That's the important first step, I think. Define Thanks. where we have over allocation. I think it's an important issue that we need to address. Well, can I think I that's speak my on that? Just hang what? on, Kate, Sarah, and then you. Can I speak too? Sorry. Um, Michael, after 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 Sarah and then Kate, all right? I agree with Thank Tom. You. 
uh, what I basically what I wanted to add was the uh, we've said that we have to give effect to uh, higher order planning documents. The yeah. current NPS in and of itself requires that we identify where there is over allocation because we can't make decisions that make it any worse. So it is very specific around over allocation and the kinds of decisions that council will need to make. I've gotten speaking order, Michael, Kate, Kevin. No, no, I'm fine. Thank okay, you. Kate. Michael, Laws. Yeah, I just want to um, uh, back Kate up. I, I see no point for this um, bullet point at all. In fact, um, I strike it out um, because the other bullet points that follow it um, set the direction, which is, first of all, you work out what the environmental outcomes are and what the science is, and then you work on from there. If you're suggesting that over allocation is occurring currently, to me it feels, well, it doesn't feel, it clearly demonstrates that you've already made your mind up, irrespective of what the science um, or the feedback from the community might be. Um, it's not just inflammatory, it's just bad English and it sends the wrong message. Um, so I, I certainly would expect that to be struck out. That's the kind of debate that you have at a quite significant detail level. Once you've worked out uh, what the science is and once you've worked out what the environmental and community needs are. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I see Kevin. <clears throat> yeah, look, I'd just like to agree with both Kate and Michael. Um, if, if we did, in fact, have out, out over allocation, Naseby would have run out of water years ago, and it's been going since uh, 1862, that water scheme, so, and is supposedly over allocated. So I, I think we're not, we haven't got the science to actually prove that, uh, and, and I think all our basis should be based on the actual science that we're going to uh, pull together over this next period. So it's not about over allocation, it's about the correct allocation to to get our environmental and social gains. So, yeah, I just think uh, I'd agree with Michael that, that possibly that should be taken right out of the right out of the picture. And I know, uh, as Sarah said, we've got to reflect what's uh, where over allocation. We can't, uh, you yeah, know, we've got to correct that. Uh, but at this stage, our we, we can say that our figures aren't even proven to that level. So, and we certainly will take effect to the national policy statement. So the clause is not yet. Yeah, it's inflammatory and doesn't even need to be there, really. Thank you. Just before we take off, and I have got Gretchen, and I've got Brian, Gretchen, and then Alexa. Can I just remind you, this is not a paper for correcting on oh, Hillary. This is not a paper for correcting. This is the, the motions that we're moving as we're receiving the report, which is about how we actually handle all the, all the rohi, all the catchments, and we adopt the proposed approach. It's not about actually talking, uh, arguing about the wording and each one. But can I go to Brian, Gretchen, Alexa and Hilary? Brian. Yeah, can you hear me there? Yes, we can. Yeah. No, good, thank you. I, I'd just like to say in relation to that over allocation, I mean, some of the comments I, I thought were an absolute nonsense. I mean, what the word actually, what it actually says here is to outline where over allocation is occurring. That's that's something that we're actually accountable on a national basis. And, and we need to understand basically the dynamics and, and how it all works. I'll make that comment. Anyway, my question is in relation to the existing water Well, well I'd, I'd like to comment back on oh, that hang on, because Kevin, I, I actually Kevin. don't, I don't believe that actually Kevin, I've just muted you because you've come in over the top. Kevin, I've just muted you because I don't. I've got a waiting list here of people. Let's go through all of well, them. Well, I, this is a this is a you point of order. All the time. This is a point of order. No, no, you're wrong. Uh, you're wrong. Give, no, give I'm us not a chance. Wrong. As a chair, you're just interrupting somebody in the middle of their speech. You're not taking a turn. I've and asked for a point of order. Our comment was just. It was just said that our comments were a nonsense. You can take that up in the next, you can put yourself down on the list and do it then. Can Brian continue, please? Thank you. Um, it was in relation to the existing water plan where one of the strands of work that's being proposed 
Um, on one strand, we're doing a, a new land and water plan by 2023. We're doing a review of our existing water plan, and then we're doing some assessment, some land assessment and so forth. My question is regarding the existing water plan. And so we're doing a review and, and how much work is actually expected in that? And how much is the existing water plan the basis of a new land and water plan. Like once the new, the existing water plan has been reviewed, does that dovetail in there? Or how does it, and, and how, does, how does it all connect? Yeah, so what happens with the existing water plan after it's reviewed? Which of you wants to answer that? Okay, Tom. Yeah, so um, this one thing that I wanted to discuss today is basically in the next six months, uh, Peter, myself, and other people in the team will review um, the existing water plan, but also the waste plan, and see basically the still those elements that we can retain and recycle into the new water plan, and 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 look at what is actually no longer usable because the issues might have changed because of uh, the legislation might have made them um, yeah, redundant. So how much we can keep from the existing water plan, how much the basis it can be for the next water plan at this point is a little bit unclear, but we're going through that exercise. That is actually the review or the purpose of the review. But is it possible that, uh, you know, like, for example, we're gonna land up with this new land and water plan. Is it possible that, for example, a third of it is actually, or a half of it, say, our existing water plan that's actually being reviewed and 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 any gaps identified and addressed. Tom, or, or Sarah, I, I, I can, oh, sorry, oh, I was just going to respond yeah. um, through you, Chair. Um, the, uh, at least half of the topics will be retained. The provisions might change and be updated, Brian. But there'll be topics that aren't currently in the plan that we'll need to introduce. Things like um, cemeteries and groundwater. Uh, as an area I know we don't address at all. Um, so there will definitely be new provisions that will come in, but a lot of the topics will stay the same and uh, just the provisions might be updated. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Gretchen, then Alexa, then Kevin if he wants a right of reply, and then Michael Deeker. Gretchen. I think Hillary would like to go as well at some stage. Oh, sorry, I missed, <laughs> you are on my list. Because Gretchen, Alexa, Hillary, Kevin, yeah. Michael D. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, hate to touch on the overallocation issue, but um, community listening to us talking about this, it is an important one. I tend to agree that we need them to really put it in this paper. It's one of the national um, directives. So it's specifically spelled out. The other ones aren't. Uh, however, it is a really crucial issue for this region moving forward. At the moment, people are allowed to take the sum of permitted takes. So in some instances, the sum of that is based on the, on the um, deemed permits, which are well and truly more than the water that's in that waterway. So um, at the moment, that isn't over allocation. Uh, so yeah, you're allowed to do that. But in the future, it's unlikely that that would continue. So um, in the future over allocation, once we sort all this out, would be the case. Uh, in some instances, tributaries have been dried out. <laughs> so um, yeah, there's some really great, great water management going on through allocation committees, but there's some permitted water takes that are currently having impacts on waterways in Otago. And we understand that, but I understand that it's very um, inflammatory language and people are doing what they're legally allowed to do at the moment. Uh, and we need to be mindful of that. So fair enough. More importantly though, I really like this paper. Um, I really liked that it addressed some things we've been talking about for a long time, which is um, overarching structure to the plan so that as well as getting into the Rohi and um, yeah, or FMUs, we've also got some overarching region-wide type issues. Uh, I know, Edward, you've brought this up a number of times. It'd be great to hear what you think um, as well. 
But I liked the fact that um, it, there's an intro, then there's a part two to this plan being proposed, which has management of resources on a region-wide scale, things like ecosystems, indigenous biodiversity, energy and infrastructure, all those sorts of issues are addressed and they're addressed for our whole region. That's great. We're not doubling up everywhere. Then we get into the FMU's Orohi and um, we have inclusions in them by exception, I read in the paper there, which is interesting and will be interesting as a process. I'd like staff to talk that through. So uh, we'd need to then, as a community in our um, FMU, be able to understand that we were different for some reason than the rest of the region. And why are we different? And why are we putting forward um, something to be included in there that's special for our catchment? And there will certainly be instances of that, for sure. Uh, but yeah, that'll, be, that'll probably be different for community to get their heads around than just thinking, okay, we're going into each Rohi or FMU and we're setting the world's our oyster for each one. Uh, bringing in that wider picture will be something to balance. Yeah, so that was something I think we needed to point out at this point uh, and have a bit of a talk about so everyone understands. And the other thing I think is interesting and useful is the tiered governance structure. I like the way that you put that forward. I actually really like um, the levels there. Uh, I wasn't too sure about Otago Regional Council and Mana to Mana together on that level. I understand why for partnership, but I wasn't too sure whether it genuinely um, actually was a vehicle for achieving partnership when council probably gets a final say. And Mana to Mana is a different, um, a totally different setting. So I'm not sure how that actually would work. The rest of it I thought was really good, tier governance, the other levels, and I liked the way that um, councillors were involved. I think it was on a rotational basis, so two would be involved, um, and I guess it would be as we moved through the um, rohi. However, I'd like to say as well that as people gained experience, like for example, um, Manu Hirakea at the moment, this council is gaining a lot of experience. Could, that, could there be some way of translating that experience through the process um, and governance rather than constantly reinventing with new um, governors as well? I'm sure that's a minor detail we can think about that. But yeah, it looks really brilliant to me, well done. Gretchen, I appreciate the wide-ranging thing. Have you got any specific questions that you want answers out of this? I'd like to answer how we're going to. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm never too sure whether we're just doing questions or we're having a say because... Yeah, that's all right. Um, it's perfectly okay, love. It's just yeah, I was trying to right. sort of go through topic by topic. But are there any particular questions there? The specific question is how are we going to um, extract... <laughs> the um, region-wide issues from the specific ones and do it really quickly, considering that in the menu here at Kia, they're yeah. going to need, yeah, we're going to need region-wide ones really quickly. Um, whichever uh, of you two, Tom, do you want Peter. to do it? Uh, can we get Peter or Tom? Uh, which one of you? Peter. <laughs> it's a case of... Um, Picking up Brian's view doesn't mean review in the sense of the RMA. It means, means we're going to look at what's in that plan, what's good, what's not good, what works, what needs to be tweaked to make it work, what we should keep because it's, it's future-proofed. And we're going to do that in a period of about four months. And basically, we sit down with the version of the plan, the current version of the water plan, and edit it. And that creates for us the region-wide section very quickly. We'll also draw on some experience that um, we know is, has been had around the rest of the country where things have worked and we've got gaps. We're just going to borrow them. No point in reinventing those wheels. Um, and that will give us a first draft of a region-wide section, which we can then start to socialise um, around the region. 
as we go through that, it will be changed iteratively as we get experience with the various FMU and the FMU sections will change as we gain experience with the region wide. So it goes backwards and forwards until we get to about July 2023 when we'll want to sit down and pull the whole thing together in a coherent and cogent form. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> um, Alexa followed by Hillary. Okay, um, there was a couple of things, and, and this discussion has just, you know, show, the discussion over the term over allocation has really shown the emotive um, nature of, of this, and we're going to have to really sort that out. And I'm thinking, I mean, we see it's quite clear from a later paper, the uh, Freshwater, our Freshwater 2020 that we're really discussing today, is that um, we need to you know, considering the science, having all the science in place isn't going to happen. I'm just going to deal with over allocation first. What is meant by over allocation? I think that we need to really define that. And my understanding, which has been challenged by some, is that over allocation refers to the potential, not the actual. So what can be taken. And I think this needs to be really cleared up and very clear what we need uh, mean by over allocation. It is referred to in national um, policy papers, so it, it is part of our language and I don't think we can cut it out, but we need to be very clear what we actually mean by it and what it actually means. We're not accusing people of anything when we use that term. We are looking at, as far as I understand, we are looking at what has been possible, not what is actually happening. I do. Um, I'm, I'm a great supporter of science, as you know, and I think that four years is not long to collect data and certainly of a living a systemic um, uh, living system is nowhere near long enough. So we'll be very lucky to have a, a baseline of much by and within four years. But I don't believe in science. Um, if uh, at the expense of action, we have to get going. And so I really think that needs to happen. And I guess that's where qualitative data becomes very important, like um, Mark Todonga Māori and um, also like, uh, you know, the community knowledge, the huge community knowledge that we have that has to be pulled in. And I think the paper has a really good um, process, outlines a good process for doing that. Uh, and so, but I did one of two things. Uh, one, why, why have these plans not been reviewed? I mean, they're supposed to be comprehensively reviewed every 10 years and they haven't been. And that seems very strange. The other thing, so I'll ask that question. And the other second question is, is there a risk by bringing the waste plan into this plan that um, of losing the importance of waste? It seems to be a second cousin. And I'd, I'd sort of like to see that addressed as well, how we make sure it isn't a second cousin of water use. Okay, lovely people. Which one? Tom, thank you, dear. Yeah. I'll have a crack first at uh, the overallocation, and I think I need to explain myself a little bit better in that regard. Um, basically, what the NPS requires us to do is to determine overallocation based on limits. So to determine whether there is overallocation, you need to set a limit. The limit itself needs to achieve a few things. First of all, those limits need to achieve the objectives that are set in the NPS FM. They need to look after the compulsory values that are stated in the NPS FM. And they also need to achieve other values that uh, are identified through a, a process of community consultation. Now, for a lot of catchments in the plan, the limit is set as 50% of MELF. So there is no clear link between the community aspirations and um, the um, limits or between what the NPS requires you to do and the limit that is currently set in the plan. So we need to review that. And it's only then that we can actually set limits. Once we've gone through that process, it's only then that we can set limits that achieves these outcomes and that we can determine over allocation. Does that explain it a little bit? Um, the 50% of mouth uh, for, for, for some catchments, we've got a more, um, a more uh, tailored allocation limit. Uh, those are the catchments for which we already have minimum flows and tailored allocation limits, but they're a minority of the catchments. For the, the other ones, we have basically a default of 50% of mouth as kind of a holding pattern, really. And the idea was always to review that. So that's 
I hope that explains a little bit about allocation over allocation. Um, in terms of the plan, why haven't we reviewed the plan? Um, throughout the last two decades, because I think that's how old the plan is now, we've gone through a number of plan changes. So 10 years ago, we went through plan change 1C process, which was basically updating the water quantity provisions. And then we had uh, a plan change, plan change 6A, which updated um, the rural water quality provisions. So what we've done instead of doing a comprehensive review is do the review piecemeal. So um, there are certain advantages to that because you can tackle issues more quickly. You don't have to review the whole plan. But the problem that we're facing now is that the, the, the consistency between the different parts of the plan is kind of falling apart a little bit. So that's why we need a full plan review, really. And um, I'm sorry, what was your other question? <clears throat> well, I include the waste. Is there a, is there an, uh, a potential for waste to become to become a second cousin by including it in here? It doesn't look like it's got the same sort of attention that it might need to have. And I'd also like to know why the waste plan hasn't been reviewed since 1997. And I'm not sure that, uh, and I think you've actually explained that plan changes is not the same as a comprehensive review and yeah. should, shouldn't be considered that way. Um, I think, yeah, I, I agree, kind of, um, the waste plan has been the neglected cousin um, because of uh, probably the fact that water quality and water quantity issues have taken up so much attention. So all our efforts in the past have gone into keeping the plan updated to the degree possible. Um, I think actually integrating the waste plan into the water plan will be good because ultimately uh, the way we manage waste must uh, look after water quality as well. Um, and integrating them will actually ensure that um, both waste provisions and other provisions that deal with management of water will actually drive towards the same outcome. Sarah, did you want to say something then? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Tom. Uh, I agree that we've done a number of plan changes and that, that, and that was the approach that had been taken over time. Um, I think there's a couple of uh, other things to remember. We have a whole suite of plans, uh, our, our water plan, our waste plan, our air plan, our coast plan, all of them are overdue for review. Uh, so it, it, um, it predates me, but it was a time, I think, when there was just a different approach taken around uh, the whole as well as reviews versus perhaps uh, incremental plan changes. Um, so, I mean, we've, we've known this uh, for the last, uh, you know, 18 months or so, and we have that uh, programmed, and that's why we've also spoken to you recently about uh, starting to do some of the preliminary work on the coastal plan as a priority. Um, but we know that we also have the year plan and uh, others to do. In terms of waste um, and planning as a whole, uh, it used to be that you did a plan for everything. Um, so what I mean by that is you did a plan for waste, you, did a, you, you might have a plan for a separate catchment rather than a whole water plan, um, et cetera. Now what is more common is you tend to have uh, consolidated plans or plans that uh, are a single plan that deal with a whole lot of issues um, rather than having them separately. I think the difficulty with having a separate waste plan is that the environment, uh, it doesn't really work in that sort of piecemeal fashion. And so those relationships between land use and water quality can't be separated out uh, just into, well, it's waste over here and it's dairying over here and it's you know, industrial discharges over here. And I think um, if you want to have an integrated resource management approach, then you probably, my recommendation would be you're better off to have a more integrated plan that looks at land and water in its entirety, rather than having a situation where you have sort of topic areas sitting off to the side and other documents. Thank you. Can I now go to Hilary, then Kevin, then Michael Deaker, then Edward? Um, Hilary. Two things. The first is the this continuing saga of the 
over allocation. I wonder whether, I think I'm hearing two things, one from Sarah and one from Tom. Sarah, I think saying that we are obliged to not you have any more allocations of water than we had before or any more use of it than we were, you know, that it's a sinking lid sort of arrangement. And I think Tom was saying a reduction to a particular level. I wonder whether um, to reduce the potential for inflammatoriness that it could just um, say, including managing com competing demands for water, determining where mm -hmm. allocation above that required by government goes or something, um, because You're not doing saying, well. saying over allocation, particularly when what, what troubles me a wee bit about what we might do there is if we start off with the assumption that there is over allocation and we look at how to reduce it and we're not, for instance, or it doesn't look like we're getting rid of the allocations we've got that people aren't using. We don't actually even know, I understand, what people are using of the allocations we've got. So um, I stumbled across three from the Hall's Dam area of people who, for example, were allocated water and they haven't applied for a new um, permit. And the reason they haven't is that they weren't using it. So we know that there are at least some people who aren't using their current allocation. And we also know that the, um, if you're not using it, we can actually have a look and find out anyone who isn't using it, even if they have applied for it and take it. And so to me, we actually need to not only know with the community and consultation and things about what how to protect the values and things about what allocation's right and the science behind it. But we also need to be very clear about what's currently being used and that the allocations match what's actually being used. And I know, I know that's- Can I just come in, Darling? Yeah. I'm really sorry, but this whole argument has just taken off on sideways. This is a report about how we actually gather information. This is a report about how we write a plan. It no. isn't a specific report on allocation in the money here here. It talks about time frames for phasing out over allocation. I'm and just asking, under the asking that yes. people use different words there to go where I think our staff want to go with that. That doesn't give the impression that we know it is over allocation and we're trying to get rid of them. Thank That's you, all Hillary. suggesting. Kevin, did you want to say anything, Kevin? Uh, yeah, look, I, look I, th I think there's a heck of a lot of merit in the, in the whole process that we're about to undertake. One of my greatest concerns is that we've been through the RPS process uh, over the last five years. We've had a lot of engagement with our people and then to be told by uh, the Minister and Skelton that we haven't done the correct the correct format. Uh, I just hope that what we're trying to do now will not overtax our people and uh, ensure that we get our public buy-in. So that's my critical point on it. And it, it was very good to hear Councillor Robertson say that, that the people uh, with their water takes have been, have been undertaking their activities legally, uh, although it may not be to the best of the environment, but technically they have been doing it legally. So I, I just want to bring on our whole public uh, as a way of going forward, that we are actually going to be setting limits to provide both our, our environmental and cultural and community objectives uh, for, uh, going forward. So that's that's where we're trying to head. Thank you. Um, Michael Decker. Yeah, thanks, Marion. Um, I want to refer to paragraph 18, which is page 10, uh, figure one, the proposed draft architecture. And I, all I wanted to say to Gwyneth, Tom, Anita, Peter, whoever it was who drafted this, uh, very well done. I found that a particularly useful diagram. And it leads me to say that I think this whole paper is high quality. Um, 
I agree with what Gretchen said before, that this gives us a very clear, and I think the clarity is partly because of that diagram in paragraph 18, a clear picture of where we're going, how it'll look, what its contents are, uh, right down to reasonably fine grained. But I cannot find in the paper or the attachments or in this diagram any reference to regionally significant wetlands. And I thought that would be a significant part of our revised land and water regional plan. Can somebody tell me why regionally significant wetlands, about which the council has done a great deal of work in the last decade, uh, is not there? Tom? Wetlands are a, a fresh water body. So um, I would expect them to sit in, in the region-wide uh, land and freshwater section. So why, I, why is it not listed there then, Tom? Well, um, basically this structure is a structure that has been prescribed by the national planning standards. So we, we adopted that structure. To, um, yeah, there's not a lot of move or discretion to deviate from it. But that doesn't mean we ignore them, does it? It doesn't ignore them. Uh, no, it, it should sit under the uh, land and fresh water within that chapter. Yeah. Okay. Well, right. just one, one more thing from me, Marion. Thanks. Uh, referring to that same bubble that Tom has just drawn our eyes to, natural character and natural features and landscapes both have question marks after them. Could somebody explain to me why they are questioned? Yeah. Who's going to have a go at that? I have no doubt they're going to leave that to me because that's my drafting. Um, they're, they're questions simply because they are the chapter headings from the NPS. And it was just a question of, are we going to have separate chapters on those? Are we going to combine them? Are we going to have them at all? Or are we going to leave it to the RPS to deal with? Which we could do. Um, so yeah, there's no there's no magic in there. It was just a case of those without question marks were clear starters. The others are less clear starters, but by the sound of it, quite likely to be in there. I think okay. there's an artist in Otago who'd have your guts for garters if it wasn't recognised. Michael. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Marion. I know Edward is going to follow me in the speaking order. So I'd like to make this comment too, and I want to echo what Gretchen said before about the Mana to Mana group and the status that it has given in this paper uh, in terms of the, the processes which we will follow as a council. Uh, I was pleased but slightly surprised to see the way in which the Mana to Mana group and process has been um, elevated and formalized into this uh, policy setting process. Uh, as a long standing member of Mana to Mana, I much admire what it achieved and the ways in which it has achieved those things. But I would like to hear from Edward whether he agrees with me and I think with Gretchen that this status that has been put on the Mana to Mana group will require some careful thinking and some increased formality, some better information flows between Mana to Mana and the council as a whole. Those are my questions. Edward, it's your turn. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Michael and Gretchen for those comments. I'll come to that. I did want to talk about the, the inflammatory wording that was referred to, and maybe it is. I would come from the point of view, no surprises though, because it appears in the NPS, in particularly to think it's Canterbury, Otago, and I think it is Manawatu. So it's already there, unless we can take it out of the NPS. I think in terms of no surprises, it's clear, it's not, it's not predetermined. There are going to be limits set that then define where I am bearing. So. I, I, I'm in favour of it staying there from a no surprises basis. On the figure two, I agree entirely with 
Gretchen and Michael, because I was never quite sure whether that was right. The principle is what we were trying to achieve. How you want to reshape it, fine. But the principle of you might need something above the Otago Regional Council and the committees is the line. That's where the decision making occurs, for example. That might help, I don't know. But I agree, the principle is what we're talking about. Negotiation. Yes, yeah. yeah. I, I'm not going to comment on any more element on the paper other than I have read it. Why it was one of those involved in the consultation, very happy with it. But if there are other, other components, I'll talk further on those when we come to that. Thanks, Edward. Andrew Noon. <coughs> Andrew. Hello. Oh. Boot. <laughs> Boot. Sorry. Sorry, right. sorry, sorry. Three comments. Uh, pleased to see the uh, that Peter referred to learning from the past and uh, oh, particularly experience in other regions. So, um, yeah, pleased to hear that. Uh, paragraph six, I think there's a typo, or well, there is a typo, where it mentions that notifying uh, the new land and water plan by 31 December should be 2023 instead of 2025. You got me there? Hello? Tom's Tom's knocking his... his oh, Chris Scott, thank you. I couldn't see Tom, sorry. Mm -hmm. The last thing, and I don't want to prolong the debate, but I understand what uh, Kate has... Well, I think I understand why Kate has raised what she had with regards to that um, water over allocation. And I wonder whether a slight tweaking of the wording which I haven't quite got in front of me right at the moment. Uh, I'm just scrolling down. Okay, so where it says response to the diverse and unique resource management challenges in Otago region and then brackets, including managing competing demands for water, stop it there and replace it with for water allocation limits. And as I think Sarah and others have mentioned, we must give full effect to the higher art, higher um, uh, ordered planning documents anyway and if this is about and I accept what Edward said about um, no surprises you know the reality is that um, it's in the overarching document anyway and um, this is about water allocation limits so if we just had that wording in so in other words removing determining where over allocation is occurring and outlying methods and time frames blah 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 and replacing it with for water allocation, oh, sorry, by developing provision for water allocation limits. Okay, I'm, I'm going to remind you, lovely. So this is really, you mightn't agree with the wording, but this is not about approving all the wording in here. This is uh, the two, two things you'll be asked is to adopt the proposed approach. It's not actually asking you to agree to each piece of wording. If you feel... Yeah. Somebody's made a chat question there. If I, if I can respond, Madam Chair, I think at the end of the day, I would imagine staff would want a clear direction from the elected arm to ensure that this process runs as smoothly as possible. And we're trying to, we're trying to develop a, a united approach. And I think it's important that at least we delve into, um, you know, this is, this is about a principle of this, this approach. So, to delve into and uh, massage it at this point may well save us a lot of angst further down the track. Could somebody help me? Because <coughs> I find this really difficult. This is a staff report to us, and we are suddenly amending what they're advising us. They're not asking us to agree with everything in there. They're asking us to adopt the proposed approach, which is really broad. We have had an hour's debate on the meaning of allocation and where it comes from the MPS, because we're worried about the effects of one group of irrigators in one Rohi oh. in Otago. And it, 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 personally, I find it out of, disproportional. But if somebody wants to move a motion to make a correction to a staff report or uh, something. They're not asking us to notice, Chair. 
They're well, asking us to, they're not asking us to note it, in which case it's their report and we just note it. They're asking us to adopt it. And if they, we're adopting it, why can't we make some- The proposed point? approach. We are yes. not adopting every word in the reports. But if you want to, and you want to hold us all up, Sarah. Can I, can I answer, can I speak? Well, I've actually recognized Sarah and I haven't recognized you, but you're after Sarah, Michael. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> okay, it is a staff report uh, and we're asking you to adopt the approach, which is not necessarily adopting every word as the chair has said. I would though, <clears throat> Just, um, you know, it does concern me that we can't have a conversation right into a paper about uh, potential over allocation or looking at over allocation or whatever it is. That is actually part of our job. And so I do, I do wonder when it is that we're going to be able to have these types of discussions because it is going to come up and we are going to have to deal with it. So all I would say is, you know, if, if it's entirely over you, if you choose, someone chooses to make a motion, that's fine. Um, but I would just say, you know, we all have a job to do here. And part of that is we are going to have to look into and discuss and address and make decisions on um, allocation and over allocation at some point. Um, so I just wonder about why we're trying to hide away from that. Has anyone got a motion? We haven't even started actually on how we actually do the governance on this report yet, but let's well, go. No, no, no. Michael. Can, I, can I speak? Thank you. Um, I think it's important to understand that staff papers are public documents. Um, and as a, as a consequence of that, they have an import and an impact that um, suggests a particular viewpoint is held by the Otago Regional Council in Toto. So it, you can't just dismiss it and say, oh, it's just a staff um, document. If the governors say, as they have said today, or a number of us, listen, we've got a bit of an issue with this, uh, then that should be rightly flagged to staff as being an issue. Um, and I think that process has been undergone today. The second issue here is uh, a little bit more important to me, though, uh, and it is that it's very difficult to have an complex or a, a, a quite complex discussion on Zoom at this time. Uh, it's an unfortunate process that we're in. I can't see you. You're not in the same room as I am. Um, and here I am, you know, at the end of a telephone somewhere. Um, so it isn't the best way in which to make decisions, but we are doing with what we've got to do. And today we've been asked to adopt a proposed approach. Now, the first time we've seen this proposed approach is in the documents that we've provided for this, meal, uh, for this meeting today. So I've, me personally, I've got a fair bit of feedback to give you. And one of the particular feedbacks I have to give to you is around uh, clauses 22 and 23. Now, um, but it's also around um, the proposed governance structure. Two, two issues, let's deal with the latter first. I don't like the idea at all of only four councillors having the governance say essentially on this. I think it should be all 12 of us by nature. And uh, the idea of having two permanent and two rotating um, sets up, I have to say, a great deal of misapprehension for the eight that aren't involved at all. Um, so that's, that's the first thing. I want to flag that very clearly. We're all elected to do a job. This is as important as it gets. We should be all in on the ground floor at the same time. First thing. Second, um, let me deal with the, um, the uh, mana to mana and Michael Deeker and uh, Gretchen have raised it obliquely. Anyhow, um, I don't, I'm, I'm struggling to deal with the idea. Oh, first of all, I mean, there's a question. There are meant to be a sort of four and how many runanga, I don't know. Um, that's not specified in the paper, uh, who are going to be driving the policy or at least the governance response on this policy. Um, I'm very, very, very wary of having Naitahu there. 
I think Naitahu and the mana to mana is a great idea. Certainly there's plenty of opportunity later on. But at the end of the day, uh, Naitahu have, just like a number of other councillors on particular issues, uh, conflicts of interest uh, around water and around land. Um, and yet um, those haven't been declared. A whole series of councillors have had to apparently go through this process. We haven't asked Naitahu what their conflicts of interest might be. And I think that that needs to be explored at some time in the very near future as well. Ultimately, though, this is the responsibility of the elected members to drive the most important and fundamental plan that we will be looking at over the next two years or two and a half years. And that's the regional water land plan, which now is going to have waste as well, and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. It doesn't matter. This is our job. And I think all 12 of us need to be involved in that. That's why I fundamentally disagree with the proposal to restrict it to just a few councillors and a few um, unnamed um, and unknown Runanga committee members. Okay, Michael, can I just reply for the two and two first up? The two and two, as you'll see, it's a revolving two because all councillors, yeah. maybe, no, you have been no, two, have, have all been allocated to a rohi. So, so if I took, I think you were Dunstan, um, you would be involved with the Dunstan, Rock, Roxburgh and Lower Clutha Rohi and be working on that and reporting. You'd have two people who would always be over all of them and working with all of them to try and develop that consistency and that cross patch. But all 12 councillors are involved. Every one of us are involved. I can see Gwyneth's hat going up and then I want to come back on, on Naitahu. Thank you, Gwyneth. I just wanted to um, draw Councillor's attention to the paragraph. Can't hear you, Gwyneth. I just wanted to draw attention to paragraph one, where it's, it's important to note that the proposed government structure is not altered. Can't hear you. Gwyneth, we're having real troubles hearing you, love. Um, I think Sarah is going to take over. Is that it? Yeah. I, um, sorry, Gwyneth, we just can't hear you, but hopefully I'm going to get this right. Gwyneth was referring you to paragraph 25, uh, which says governance and oversight over the day-to-day -day functioning of this regional team will be provided by the ORC's executive leadership team, which can Paragraph 21. Oh, sorry. Was it 21? 21. Okay, hang on. A tiered governance structure is proposed. There you go. That's it. So that's right. So if you look at 21, it talks about it doesn't alter the current role of council in the plan development and adoption process. It's just a part of the, our process to get here. Uh, you always have the ultimate say as a council um, and uh, our iwi partners have um, always respected that, even in the arrangement that we have at the moment, uh, where we have iwi partners on this committee. Part of the discussions when we initially went to this model were around the fact that council could always make a different decision to the one made at this committee, and there was comfort expressed by iwi at that time. So I think, um, you know, it's something that is well understood. Okay, can I, can you, first of all, Michael, do you, just doing the two and two, do you now see that the council does have... Um, no, 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 far from it. That doesn't, that, that hardly mollifies the concerns at all. In fact, it amplifies them. Um, in fact, when you take it to 21, I mean, this is the first time we've had the opportunity to look at a governance structure. We've been presented with a fait accompli. You either adopt this or you don't. There isn't an alternative that's being promoted here. It's this one. And so I am going to get Toei on this because this is the first time that I've had an opportunity to contribute. And so, and I'm saying, um, and I actually want to use the, re the regional pest plan as a pretty good example of that. Or the um, policy, another bad example of, um, of past where we've delineated councillors when we've had annual plans where only six councillors have been allowed to hear submissions. We need to be involved in this from day one. Now, it may well be, as you say, Marion, that um, I have taken some sort of vestigial responsibility for the Dunstan um, FMU. Um, 
but it, it's, it's no reason why I shouldn't be involved in the Tairi or anywhere else. We are each responsible for the region. And it would then give us, each of us, a say and an understanding of every aspect of our region. At the moment, I'm involved, dear Lord, as a councillor living in Cromwell in the Dunstan Ward in the Dunedin bus timetable um, because that's the way this council works. So why, on the most critical and crucial policy area that we confront over the next two and a half years, would you decide that eight councillors won't be involved in that? It doesn't matter if it's not my area. I should That's still not be what involved it says, in Michael, that. at all. It doesn't say anything like that. If you read the second yes, sentence, the second sentence, paragraph 21, the current role of the council makes it clear that the <laughs> That's council's after. role... Michael, you've missed the point. That's after after the governance team has been involved. All you've got then is some probably some sort of veto right at the end of it once it gets to governance, but you're Michael, not there can on I the just, ground. Let's ask a question first here. Can I ask a question of, of one of the staff? How many meetings per Rohi will there be that will involve two councillors as you're going through? Do you think there might be about 10? So if we have the entire council for every meeting in every Rohi, we're looking at something like over 100 meetings for councillors. Would that be correct? We don't know. Well, we do know, actually. No, we don't. There's nothing in the paper, and you're making this up. You're making this up as you go. No, I'm not. I'm going to ask nothing something. I'm going to ask Andrew, Michael. Andrew, how many meetings of the Manu Hira Reference Group have there been that you've been at? Uh, so I was appointed after the um, the election, and I've attended four or five, and I imagine they had had two or three prior to that, prior to the end of the last Toronium. So I think that I'm right in saying that there are about 10 meetings per rohi. If this council is up to 12 councillors being on least uh, 60 meetings, as well as all the other meetings this year, then I will believe you, uh, Michael. That's what you're asking. So wait on. So wait on. No, no, wait on. Your logic doesn't make sense because you're expecting two ORC councillors to be on it all the time. Yes, I am. Aren't you? Yes, I am. Uh, who are they going to be, Marion? I will be one of them. And you will be one of them, will you? Yes. So I'll you're going to that. go to these ten. Well, so, so you've just so you're really sort of shooting your own argument down. No, here, I'm not. You? Because you're saying at the one time I don't, we can't do that because that would, doesn't make sense. But you then you expect that two councillors will be doing the whole lot. Yes, because they will be, and they'll be maybe tag, tagging it half and half. I don't know, but we need that un whole understanding and the linking up, and that's what that's about. And yes, it is a lot of work, but you're asking it for 12 councillors all the time instead of dividing I'm saying up Rohi by Rohi. I'm saying the opportunity to be there for all 12 councillors to attend, absolutely. Thank you, Michael. There's one other thing you raised, Michael, and then I've got two people with their hands up. I just want to sort of take you on about Naitahu. I really think you need to go back and read the Resource Man Management Act and release the, the, re the ones going up through the House, and you will see that it is written very clearly that in any work to do with any resources in this country, we are under the Treaty of Waitangi, and it is about partnership. I find that particular one there, as we've driven up here in the governance with Otago Regional Council, negotiating with with Man, with the uh, Naitahu is totally appropriate. Um, Edward, then Tom. Kia Madam Chair. Just on the mana to mana, just a wee bit of background. It was established around 2000 and 11, and it was normally representatives from the Papatipu Runinga, including Southland, used to send a rep as well. They haven't of recent years, but there's provision within the terms of reference for that to occur. And I can confirm what Sarah said. There is, it's not a decision-making body. It's a body where those ruining of people and representatives of the council come in and discuss those upper level principles around whatever it is we're discussing, not a decision-making forum. And it's to ensure that the regional council as well 
well informed and uh, engaged so that, that those principles then filter down through the, the work of, of the regional council. I note in terms of the blue boxes there, there's no wiring connection. That's quite important to note. The governance group, the regional team, the FMU teams don't particularly see a wiring direct in there. What's a wiring, love? What do you mean by a wiring? You see how there's lines yeah. connect. One feeds into the other, I presume. Yeah. In, the bridge, in figure two, see the, the connecting lines? Yep. So there's, there's no direct connection to, to the, the governance group, the regional team, the FMU oh, okay. with the with the mana to mana. There'll be other processes to engage on that. So the mana to mana is really to preserve that treaty partnership relationship and ensure that the right information and the right exchanges are occurring at that upper level in the front early on so that uh, deviations don't occur down the, down the line. Now, can I just elaborate a wee bit more? Currently, you might say, for example, we've been working at the FMU level, if you call the Manuheta Care Reference Group an FMU. Yeah. We do not, they are not responsible for, for your treaty partnership work. That's how we see it. That's, at the end of the day, they're not able to fulfill that function. The, what am I hearing you say? The MRG doesn't do a negotiation with you. They they just either listen and is that what you? It's not like the Mana to Mana Otago Regional Council, right? Yes, we're we're just one of a group there in the at the MRG. And what has happened in other regions, we find that it loses its shape quite quickly. Meetings are set up, other processes are run and uh, your input gets completely diluted, so, right. such that the treaty partnership walks right out the door. Yeah, understand. You become, you become the equal of Co's, or you become the equal of whatever. Right, understand. Tom, you've got your hand up. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to you, um, this morning I was thinking about how I could describe figure two, actually. And um, you, you notice the color coding. Um, yeah. I was thinking about a metaphor to describe it really. The blue, the blue boxes, they're like the cargo vessel, you know, uh, that has to deliver that um, land and water plan by 2023. The green boxes, they're the pilot vessels. They provide guidance. And um, mana to mana, and the ORC's policy and strategy planning committee both provide policy guidance into that process. So it's, it's important, I wanna stress that because through the policy and strategy planning committee, the full council has a say in setting directions as well. Um, the role of, of the governance group really is to see, to monitor whether that big vessel is actually sticking to the directions that were set by the blue box, uh, sorry, the green boxes, by those pilots. Right. That, is, that is how the, the, the diagram was set up. But there is, it's not just mana to mana, it's the full council also through um, the, the, the input done by the strategy and planning committee. Mana to mana does have, um, they will be pulled in, so to speak, as a forum to um, resolve issues that are culturally specific around partnership, EV partnership. And I just wanted to clarify that. Well, can I ask a question in related to that? Michael, yes. Um, it's section 24. Um, and it says to me that this is uh, section 24 paragraph 24 seems to define the governance structure as in what the regional team does is that right tom yes yeah so so when i talk when we talk about these two councillors plus two they're going to do those bullet points in 24 is that correct mm, no because the um the councillors sit above that really um the regional team is basically um operational it's really drafting those region-wide provisions 
um, the councillors right. that sit in um, the governance group, they, they kind of reflect as to what is done by the regional team actually aligns with what is the direction set by the policy, uh, sorry, the strategy and planning committee and, and mana to mana for <laughs> So thank you for clarifying, because that really means that Clause 23 is in effect, isn't it? That the governance team, the governance group in Figure 2, are going to be doing what's specified there. And I'm not sure, Marion, if there's 10 meals, meetings per rohi in those bullet points. No, and there are. Um, but when, sorry. Because there are no, they're an overview of policy, which is what Tom really has just said. So that's for the point that I was making about the governance group. There's no reason why you can't have 12 councillors doing those bullet, those one, two, three, four, five, six bullet points. It's not the detail that you thought it was, Marion. Well, then I'm looking at, if I go down, the final tier, paragraph 26, comprises the individual uh, FMU teams, all right? And each of these yep. little team, teams will have, and they will have attached to them, to one or two councillors. Yeah, but wait on. That's different from what the governance group is doing, which is <laughs> itemised on clause 23. I can see it. And that is the reason why I think there should be 12 councillors. The level of detail that you're describing at Arohi, I wouldn't expect the, the governance group to be involved in. Can I ask from Sarah or from um, Femijik, how many meetings of a year do you think the w LWRP governance group is going to have this year? Can you hear me or am I still? Yep. No, you're good. So I think we chatted with. Um, I'll try. <clears throat> Jonas can uh, tell me if I'm not getting it correct. I think that the governance role uh, will involve the things in paragraph 23, but as part of achieving those things in paragraph 23. So achieving those responsibilities, I would fully expect that that would involve some attendance at meetings in the FMU construct. So therefore, I don't think it's as simple as saying, well, this can be all 12 because we're only doing these things. Because I guess what I would ask you would be, um, how would you necessarily contribute to the thinking and general content of the proposed land and water plan if you're not necessarily having some exposure to FMUs and, and stakeholder thinking in, in the first hand. So um, similarly with monitoring, yes, monitoring uh, can be as simple as getting a report from us, but you might want to have engagement uh, at an FMU level to understand how the process is working for stakeholders and others. So I don't think it's as cut and dried as saying, oh, well, we 12 councillors can do paragraph 23 and no councillors need to be involved in paragraph 26. No, but you're sort of proving, Sarah, what I've been saying all along is that the lack of definition in this paper doesn't allow us to actually make a proper and informed decision. Remember, I've only seen this for the first time for this meeting. Um, about the best governance structure that we could have. Remember, we're being asked to adopt this as the proposed structure. And I'm saying, and flagging to you, that we don't have all the councillors involved. The more councillors involved, the better feedback you'll get and the better policy you'll make. Um, and that the level of detail... And, you, and, and again, you know, what will they do? Oh, well, we haven't thought about that yet. So well, I all I'm going back to, Marion, what I'm going back to is... When it comes to that governance group, I want to see all the councillors there. Second point, Marion, sorry, but partnership is not a 50-50 principle. The court of uh, the uh, Supreme Court didn't come up, well, it was then the Court of Appeal didn't come up with that view. Um, I don't mind Runanga being involved somewhere along the line, 
But all I'm saying is it didn't suggest that there should be a 50-50. There is no principle that suggests that. The principle of partnership didn't come up with a number. Okay, Michael, those are your views. Thank you very much for them. Uh, can I say that I'm sure that as most meetings that are ever able, all councillors will be expected or be always open to attend them, uh, especially if there's 20 of them. And I'd hope to see you at the next Mana to Mana meeting of which you are a member. Um, Kevin. I'm, I'm not, Kevin. but it doesn't matter. Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Look, to, uh, through you, just probably a, a question to, uh, to Lynn and Edward, uh, based on uh, Edward, you made, made a comment earlier on about reference groups can't deal with iwi matters. Um, when you're referring, you'd sort of moved away from and doing it through the Mana to Mana partnership, which I, I, I hear what you're saying there. So where, how confident are you that we can get uh, Renoka representatives into, into that governance group? So we're saying we're going to have a, a couple of each um, at each of those meetings and through that process. And if, if they come up and your mana to mana are bringing, uh, are bringing down direction to them. And so I, I would assume that group will be formulating through the rohis that will be formulating uh, a community view of how to put everyone's views together. Uh, so what, how can you convince them to be part of it? Because I think, to me, I think that's critical that that, that, that's where we're going to get our best traction for a complete community buy-in and compute, you know, complete uh, the best result. Can I answer that? Yes, go for it, Edward. Thank you. Better. Um, the Mana to Mana have a specific function to meet with the representatives of the regional council. They don't necessarily get down into the governance group. They are different people. The people who we will put into the government's group will have that expertise. So I expect that it's quite achievable. They'll be, they may or may not be the same people, people who are sitting in mana to mana. So that answers that. The FMU teams, as we've always said, we're there to share information the best we can to assist them to understand what our values and interests are. But when it comes to the decision making and in the, in the direction, it overlays any final plan. The regional council makes that decision, and that's where the relationship the partnership needs to function. The FMUs cannot perform, we don't think, that service for the regional council. They can go a long way. It's about sharing information. Yeah, through you, Madam Chair, but, but surely it, it's um, it's the interaction with those people that are going to formulate the, the concepts and the plans for that for that particular district. Um, so to get uh, to get that best buy-in, certainly will be the down the downward pressure from mana to mana or or from the leaders that will be will be assisting that, or, or at least the confidence. Uh, uh, from mana to mana, that the, the people involved in that in that next level down are going to be listened to. Um, look, I, I'm just, you know, to me, it, that just seems to be the point, the place where we're going to get the greatest, the greatest wins for everyone. Just clarify the greatest wins at what level, Kevin? Well, well we're in the, in the uh, LWRP governance group. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. That's where the, where the, and the, yeah, so, so you're from, from time to time sending down, um, and w which we've worked out the, the basis of the, um, the plans and the, the concepts and everything, but uh, it, it's getting to the nitty gritty of how that's going to affect communities and, and the community values. Um, so that, that's the, the Omakau shopkeeper working with the Renaka to say, well, that this is this is the best way to, to keep that bit of river beside the Oprah Bridge going the best way. Um, so I'm just I'm just trying to get some way of installing the confidence to ensure that we're gonna have the Renaka actually being there and confident that we can work through as a team at that level. 
Are you, mean, are you meaning, Kevin, the FMU groups? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's in, in the... Um, sorry, my, my other screen's just gone gone down. So under... Uh, so you've got IRC's Planning and Strategy Committee, then you've got the LWRP Governance Group. Mm. And the FMU... So, I think that which is the FMU link, yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're expected to include an iwi lead, and I think Edward is the mo to forward and saying I think today there was an email came out to Runaka to for people to start considering um, having a role in those FMUs um, because we have a number of different Runaka members who have expertise, scientists yeah. and so on have have the expertise, and yeah. so we've already got our members thinking about. What they could contribute there. Right. So, was that answering what you said? Yeah, yeah but I, I mean, again, but um, from, from above, we need. Yes, I'm, I'm putting <laughs> up on a pedestal here, Edward. <laughs> but, but, but from above, we need. You know, we need to ensure that that you're comfortable with that, that they will be listened to at that level, and what the, the work that they do, and come to agreements with the community, so that it is going to work as well. I, I mean, that's the that's that whole. That's or not work, always easy. working it through together. That's not always easy. No, no, no absolutely, Marion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, because yeah. because there are people who have who have got a lot of prejudice around these areas. Yeah, and that and it's and it's sometimes um, sort of. Oh no, I won't go down there. But it, yeah, I, I do find it hard sometimes at very local levels, and I think that's a little bit of what Edward was indicating mm. before. We have <laughs> much experience in zonal committees, yeah. these, um, these forums, and I can assure you it does not work in the interests of iwi. No. Yeah. Well, we need to change that. Yeah. yeah. Darlings, can I just say to you all, um, I'm shivering here because I've been sitting with the doors open, and I promise that we'd take 10 minutes. Can we have 10 minutes to at least get up and stretch uh, and be back here at 3.15? That's less than 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you, people. Liz, can you hear me? Yes, I can. So I'm just I've just switched on and come out again. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, but I might I'm gonna get some feedback. I'm not sure what happened there. Yeah, your your sound is cutting in and out. Yeah, I'm not not hearing you. It is live.
Hey, Liz, are you there? Liz, no? I'm here. Hi, who's oh, Sarah? Yeah, can you hear me now? I'm just trying headphones. I'm not sure yeah, what's I wrong. Can. I can yeah. hear you now. That's really weird. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to have headphones in. Okay, cool. Thank you.
Hello. Hi, Brian. Yeah, how you going, Michael? Just wondering Good. whether. I... Yeah, but it looks like the others are all having a cup of coffee somewhere. Are we allowed to sneak in? I'm having okay. one here. How are you? <laughs> People, I'm here, but I just can't. Haven't got the screen. It seems to have disappeared. I've got some minutes on it. Yeah, yeah. we're looking at Liz's screen. Ah, good. Got you off. Okay, oh. it's three nineteen. Can we resume? Can I re resume? Yeah. I've, um, people, can I just say to you, I can't always keep up with all the chat notes as they come through. I tend to be watching the note, the, the screen for um, people waving at me or putting up their hands. Can I suggest a way forward, given that it's 319? I suggest that I'd like a mover and a seconder for that the council receives this report and two adopts the proposed approach. I'll move I've it. Got two, I've got Michael Deacon, I've got seconded Alexa. Now, I'd like to um, ask if there's any things that they would like, people would like to debate on that. Yes, Kate. Okay, cool. um, I, I had foreshadowed in the chat, and I'm sorry, Marin, you haven't seen it, and that's fine, that we go ahead with receiving the report or noting the report, and that we, in principle, adopt. The, the process, but the actual membership of the governance group it has to come back as a work, another paper anyway, yes, because we, none of us know who's going to be the revolving councillors or the two others, and we take the whole governance structure out until that next paper. So, um, and that picks up on Michael Law's issues and, and gets us much better clarity about our roles. So, um, I'm happy to move that, and I think that'd be helpful. That's a moving and amendment. Are the mover and seconder, and you are presumably seconding the amendment, are you, Hillary? Yes. Okay. Before I before I accept that, do the mover? Yes, I can see you, um, oh, Gwyneth. Gwyneth. Um, before I accept that amendment, can I check with the mover and seconder? Um, well, I can, speaking for me, I'm pretty happy with what Kate's suggesting. I think that's a way forward, and it's one I want, to hear, I want to hear from Gwyneth. I want to hear from Gwyneth first. I'm, I'm not sure what the implications of that are. And I, yeah, I'm not okay. entirely happy. Gwyneth. Gwyneth. Hi, I just wanted to clarify um, the the way you um, spoke about it, Kate. Slightly different from what was in the chat room. Are you proposing to remove the whole governance piece from the paper as a uh, resolution? I'm just, I'm just trying to, in terms of actually going, moving forward, putting in place that governance uh, structure is fairly important in terms of progressing. Or is it what? just the the land and water governance group? Just the land water. Uh, regional plan governance group because at the moment we don't know who those two ORC councillors are. I appreciate that Marianne said she wants to be that, but that would require its own paper anyway. I know I'm one on councillor on one FMU, but I don't understand who the other person might be on that FMU. So there's obviously other things that have to come in here and have to come back to us for agreement. So that's why I'm saying if we say in principle that's right, the numbers and who those representatives are and it may not be those numbers. We may change the numbers. Um, that, but we exclude out of making the decision at the moment. So could you be really specific? Which paragraphs are you excluding from me here? I'm suggesting that on the diagram on figure two, we're not making the decision on the, on the core or the variable numbers at the moment. We're saying there's going to be a governance group, but what that looks like, we're not confirming today. So you don't you want to exclude paragraph twenty three? Is that clear? Well, you, um, yes, we're not making that as a final decision. Yeah. Is it only paragraph twenty three, Kate? I'm really trying to be clear because I hate making amendments on the fly. Well, I think we're making it on the fly anyway because none of us know who those members are. And anyway, I presume so there was I'm, going to be another paper on that. So I'm, second, I'm seconding that it's paragraph 23. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Gwyneth, can I ask no, you? Just quickly three? again. So is What's it the whole of paragraph, paper? just quickly, the whole of paragraph three, 23. So you're saying we haven't made a decision on whether or not we have a land, water, 
plan governance group or we just haven't made a decision on the will consist of four councillors um, and Runaka representatives but the remainder of the paragraph will exist as to what their roles and responsibilities are. Yes, I think yes. it's that we're just not dealing with the membership. The councillors or of the revolving, uh, or the Runaka representatives, Any of it. the whole thing? Any of the numbers. I don't understand. I'm sorry, Kate, right. I do not understand you. It reads at the moment, the LWRP governance group, which will consist of four ORC councils, two permanent and two re revolving, and Runaka representatives, doesn't have a number, will ensure a strong link with the ORC's governing body. What is it that you want to delay? I think what Kate's suggesting, Marion, is that we replace the numbers with, uh, with an X because the numbers have not been decided, let alone who the, who the people would be. It's not the, the governance group that the amendment is deleting. It's simply the, the scale of that group and who would yeah. be on it. Is that, is that, would you agree with Kate? Yeah. So we yeah. replace, so the amendment is that in paragraph 23, we replace, I can see you, Kevin, we replace yep. the numbers uh, four, two and two with an X. Is that okay? Is that what you're saying, Kate? Um, yeah, and that those matters come back to a paper on itself on what the LWRP governance group looks like. Yeah. Kevin. Um, uh, yeah, but if you just simply changed it to yeah. uh, consist of ORC councillors in bracket, number and membership to be determined, close brackets. Same thing, but I agree with you. Okay, that's yeah. right. Do you accept that, Kate? Yeah, that's either. Yeah. Do you accept that, Hillary? Uh, yes. To the mover and seconder, that's Alexa and um, Michael Decker. Do you? Yes, agree? I do. Do you, Alexa? I. Yeah. Okay. With that. Was that the... two votes, Alexa? <laughs> uh, I, I don't. I don't, I don't think it does anything useful at all. But whatever is how I feel about it. So the 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 movement is and it's moved. Alexa and Michael Deeker, that we receive this report and that we adopt the a proposed approach for developing a new land and water regional plan with the following amendment to paragraph 23, and I'm not going to repeat it. Do you get a sense of that, Liz? Thank you. Is there any discussion? There being no discussion. I'll put the vote and I'm going to do it by roll call. Uh, can you tell me whether you're in favour or not? Hillary? In favour. Michael Deeker? In favour. Alexa? Yes, in favour. Marion? In favour. Carmen? Gary? In favour. Thank you, Gary. Michael Laws? Kevin? You in favour, love? Was it? Yeah, it's been good. Andrew Noon? In favour. Gretchen? In favour. Brian Scott? In favour. Kate Wilson? In favour. I declare that carries. Councillor, Councillor Hobbs, could we get Dr. Carter and Mr. Ellison's vote? Oh, please? I'm sorry, darlings. <laughs> God, I'm just going down my list. Thank you. Um, Lynn, please. Yes, yes in favour. And um, Edward, please. In favour. Thank you. I'm really sorry. I'm, I, I'm using my list that I use for councillors all the time. Okay, so I declare that closed, uh, not closed, passed and closed. Um, can I just say this to all of you? We get five days for these papers. Um, that was, an, I found that a really detailed and good paper. When you yeah. have a question about a paper, a really serious question, and you, and you seek clarification, please, can you actually make contact with the writers of the paper and do that ahead of the meeting to a certain degree? Um, because we did actually go round and round and I, and I, and I, and I really apologize because I had hoped to go through this in a kind of a logical fashion, you know, taking each bit 
but we just went wild. So I've got to find a way of doing this. And maybe it is that I do leave it with staff to take us through it and we listen. So my apologies for that. Can we now go please to the next matter on the agenda, which is, which is? Adopting that paper or not? We have just done it, darling. I thought we adopted the amendment. No, you two uh, I... as um, mover and seconder accepted mm. it and it went into the main I'm motion. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, you're right, Marion. You're not gonna change your vote on me, are you, Michael? Oh, I might. <laughs> okay. Can we go on to the next matter then, please, people, which is matters for noting Resource Management Act, Resource Management Amendment Bill and implications for ORC. Um, and can I ask Rachel, is it Rachel and Gwyneth? Rachel, which is Rachel? There we are with a, with a lovely background picture, Rachel. Um, and I've got to say that although this report begins, the report updates the committee on proposed amendments following select committee deliberations. And I think it's up for third reading in the house shortly, but you, you will acknowledge, won't you, that there is further work ongoing and they're still meeting on the RMA uh, reform. So there's a second report coming through on this. Yes, this is phase one of yeah. the um, amendments and, but there's a more, why a broader um, system review being undertaken as well, which will cover outside the RMA potentially. Right, thank you. It's in your hands. Do you want to draw anything to the attention of councillors? Uh, well, there's one correction in the paper around um, page 25, paragraph 16, the fourth bullet point, and paragraph 18. They um, they pretty much need to be deleted because, um, yeah, so it changes about the uh, mana rohi yep. agreements. They were, those mm -hmm. changes were made in 2017. So that was an error. So that's just for noting. Um, as far as I know, the bill is at its second reading through Parliament. So it's about to be debated and then it will have its... Um, Committee of the House. Yep, then it'll go through its final reading. And that's expected to happen before the general elections. Sorry, so, love. Um, there are two things it has to do. If it's if it's at second reading, if it's completed that, it'll have committee of the whole that's in the house. And then it'll have third reading. And committee of the whole can take several hours, if not days. Okay. Yes, no, you'll be much more familiar with that process I have, than I am. I have to um, nice. Yep. So that's where it's at. Um, there's been a, probably worth noting there's been a few other changes to the um, RMA proposed under the COVID-19 bill. Um, so the main ones there are that um, publicly information that needs to be publicly available can now be done so online as long as it's uh, freely available. And um, that's instead of it having to be available in a library. Mm -hmm. And the other change is that hearings can be um, you can be heard remotely, um, either through audio or audio visual. So, right, that's that. Um, in terms of what the bill is seeking, it's seeking to um, reduce complexity, and increase certainty in the RNA processes, and also to restore some previous participation, public participation opportunities. Um, most notably, there will be a new freshwater hearing process, which uh, ORCs. RPS and land and water plan will go through. So that means that um, the freshwater hearings panel will uh, make decisions, well not make decisions, sorry, make recommendations to the council in terms of what the decisions version should be. Um, the council can then accept or reject those recommendations, but if it rejects them, there can be appeals on merit, otherwise it's only appeals on points of law. So that is intended to speed up the process through the Environment Court, basically. Rachel, can I get a clarity there? So that if we were doing something like the land and water plan, yep. the water plan would go after the water parts would go after fresh water, but the things to do with waste onto land or land usage, even though it affects water, would go off through the commissioners. 
No, I think my understanding no. is that all of the land and water plan will go through that hearings panel because, um, okay. like you say, because of those linkages between the land use and the water. So the freshwater hearings panel replaces commissioners? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay, people, that's quite a change. But yeah, um, if I could just clarify, Rachel's right, it's everything that is freshwater or related to freshwater, so it incorporates, they, they broaden the language a little bit in the second reading to uh, try to work through some of those nuances of those separations. So for us, it would be the entire plan. So for us, it could, we could do air, and air wouldn't go through a freshwater panel. Air would go up to the commissioners. Gotcha. Yeah, they didn't quite broaden it that much. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Rachel. Go on. So, yeah, that's the second um, of the major changes the bill is seeking, the freshwater hearing process. Um, the third main change is around um, enforcement and environment court provisions. So, and the biggest change there is that the EPA can now, um, now has enforcement functions as well under the RMA. Well, what does that mean? Bill, can you give us an example? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it means that if there's a breach of the RMA, then that can't that can be enforced by the EPA instead of just by council. So the EPA couldn't step in to take enforcement action, whereas previously it would be, um, yeah, they couldn't. Councils could, I think Doc could. Um, Sarah probably knows more than me about that. But. Sarah, can you give me an example? Sure. Um, the idea around this is uh, potentially it might be useful um, the way, well, there were two things actually. First of all, this came about because the Crown had a good look at the, um, the enforcement uh, um, activity undertaken across local government. Um, and there were some concerns that were raised about the level of enforcement that was undertaken and the regional sector responded to that and gave the minister a, a renewed confidence um, in what happens in the regional sector, but not so much in, the, in TAs. Um, and so that concern exists. The other is that uh, there was some recognition that there might be times when uh, it would be useful to have the EPA come in and take over an investigation rather than to continue it at the regional council. And the example of that is really around perhaps the prosecution of another council. Um, where perhaps it might be more comfortable for the EPA to undertake that. So um, that's what uh, the intent is. Um, the reality in terms of how that plays out is somewhat questionable, given that the EPA has a small number of staff located in Wellington. And as we know, investigations need to start in a timely manner right when uh, the incident occurs. So um, how that will play out is, is an entirely another matter, but that's the intent. Thank you. Rachel, any other things you want to add, Deb? Um, well, not really. In terms of the select committee, well, the select committee recommendations pretty much have kept the um, substance of the bill. There's a few changes, uh, technical changes around implementation. So, um, for example, how the freshwater hearings panels are resourced, it was confirmed that they'd be resourced through councils rather than central government. Um, there's new provisions recommended around climate change mitigation. So this means that councils will need to take climate change mitigation into account when they're making plans, policy statements and um, resource consent decisions from December 2021. Um, so yeah, that's just tidies up a bit of a, a, uh, a difference between the climate change bill and the RMA that was there. And also um, stock exclusion, it's proposed that that be applied to the margins of water bodies as well as the water bodies themselves. So that's in the recommendations from the select committee. Um, yeah, that's probably about it. Thank you. Are there any questions to Rachel or to Anita? Not all good stuff. There being no questions, can somebody move that the council notes this Happy report? Happy Kate, to. It's a good report. Oh, are you are you moving it, Kate? Yep. Moved, Kate. Seconded. Seconded. Uh, Alexa, all yes. those in favour, please say aye. 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 And aye. against, carried. The next 
issue on the agenda was, oh, I've lost it. The next issue on the agenda, people, if you could remind me, is what? Freshwater 2020. Okay, who's leading this? That's me, Councillor. Hi, Hoff. me, Peter. Yeah. Off you go. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've tried to boil down into six very quick points, what's in the paper and what's in the report. And if I just work through those and then the, the debate can start. I think the first thing to, to note is that the report's very strong on the fact that fresh water is connected to everything and that the effects are cumulative. Now, it's nice to hear that word cumulative coming through because it's the one word in the RMA that for the last 29 years has been ignored. <laughs> so we're now talking about cumulative effects and we're talking about spatially and in time. And the report's quite clear on that. The second point to note is that the report notes that knowledge is imperfect. Now, we all know that, but it's recording it. And it's imperfect because of the complexity of the freshwater system. They are so complex. Now, yes, we've had 29 years or much longer to try and sort this out, but we still haven't got there. Um, the third thing the report does is it takes the State of the Environment Reporting Act and it uses the three key um, concepts in that. And basically I can summarize that into saying preference cause changes to the state of the environment and change has an impact. And that's what the uh, Environment Reporting Act is, is requiring us to consider. The important thing here, though, is that the challenge in front of all of us is understanding all these connections and what the cumulative effects actually are. Um, I think I can say that this publication, and I put this in the, I think it's about paragraph five, it reinforces the diversity that exists across the country. And that includes this region. Yes. It reinforces the need for comprehensive and integrated thinking. In other words, we've got to do some real hard thinking. And it shows that our knowledge is variable and incomplete. But what it doesn't do is suggest that we pause the development of freshwater management regimes until the knowledge or more perfect knowledge is available. In other words, it's in, in encouraging us to use the precautionary principle and keep moving. So that's a very brief summary of what's in that report. It is a stock take type report um, and they will be produced frequently in the future. Um, this just happens to be a report on one that was published this year. Are there any questions to Peter about this report? Kate? Thanks Peter and it's not a trick question but I, and I doubt we can. But can in the infometrics is there any way of knowing where we as a region is placed compared to the national average? It's not declared in the report, no. No, they've- And we don't, everything. and at the moment we don't have measurements. I mean, part of what I think the challenge of Peter Skelton said to us was, you need to get into a place where we all have a similar way of measuring this stuff and can understand where we're placed. And we're not there yet. So I don't, uh, Rachel, do you have any comment around that? We've just, I was just going to say, we've got Rachel Ozan here from the science team as well. Uh, I'm not sure. Hi, oh, Rachel. This is Rachel. Oh, Rachel, dear. Rachel, have you got any comments? Can you hear me, Rachel? Do, 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 do. Okay. Any other questions? Alexa. Uh, what what strikes me in this um, in this report what really did strike me was uh, the idea that we really we've been so uh, reliant on science and evidence and it's what we're always called on to provide to back up any action and yet what this report uh, told me I went to the the full report and had a reasonably good chug through that as well was that it. Um, we, we can't actually provide that science. The system itself is so complex and it's so interrelated, it's going to be next to, it's very difficult to have that science in any uh, kind of uh, digestible form. So, I mean, I love to see cumulative come into it. I was so happy to see that. And But then, then I started reading through and going, how 
can we possibly provide the evidence that people are calling from for to change whatever we do in this environment? And I wonder if you've got any clarity on that, Peter, or if you have a comment on that. No clarity. It's a, it's a very <laughs> difficult issue, I hate to say. But I think uh, I'm going to draw on some experience here, but I think I think one of the things we've got to do is start is start trusting our gut a wee bit, if I can put it that way. We might not be able to produce a scientific report on a specific catchment that says this is the specific problem and this is the specific solution to that problem. But there's a lot of experience around it. Actually, these things generally are connected to these things. And generally, this causes the problem, generally. And here's a bunch of things that you might choose to do to resolve that problem. And we move on that basis. That's not to say we should stop gathering data and turning that data into information. But it is to say we've got to start putting some stakes in the ground and moving forward from here. Can I just add to that, um, Peter? Unfortunately, Roseanne, um, Rachel Roseanne's having a few problems with the mic, but um, from a science perspective, um, you might have noted, I think, one of the risks uh, in the previous paper we were discussing was actually some of the work we're doing um, and looking to do with Cawthon and, and, and you were to actually come up with a technical approach that allows us to get the best science we can get in the time frames we've got. Um, and so that's what the science team's tackling um, now. Um, and and part of the approach being proposed in the previous part, part um, um, paper was in discussion with science around how they might try and deliver the best we can deliver in the timeframes. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. Hey, I've got a, a lineup of people, Hillary, Brian and Alexa. Hillary. Um, I can see why it's tempting to say we never have perfect information and we have to keep moving and protecting the environment even without it. What concerns me a wee bit, and it's not our concern because it's just where the government's going from, but um, is that we can't help ourselves as human beings putting out graphs and things that start saying things like 75% of our waterways are degraded or something. And then you look at the small print at the bottom and it says something like, according to a modeling exercise we did in 2014 or something, um, and so it's very hard to compare apples uh -huh. with oranges and things. And I would just caution us to remember that when it's imperfect information, sometimes we can compare things, sometimes we can't. And if it's imperfect and we're basing major decisions on it, we might just need to go and find out what's actually true. There's an argument about what's true. Brian. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think from my perspective, we need to continue to develop policy, we need to continue to develop science, but parallel to that, we need to keep doing some positive stuff on the ground. And that's, you know, we previously talked about the eco fund. So we're not putting all our eggs in one basket. So we're doing practical stuff on the ground that our gut tells us will work. Um, it also seems to me that, you know, recently we've been hearing a lot about the economy hurting. And yes, it is. Um, but you know, this what this paper is all about is that the environment is also hurting, and and um, it seems to me that's just such a fundamental for all of us as, as counsellors. Um, and some of the, so the key points Peter's also already referred to it. You know, to adopt a precautionary approach, and in terms of the policy that we set. And to bear in mind that, you know, these three issues, these three issues where our native freshwater species and ecosystems are under threat. As you tell you, the water is polluted in urban farming and forestry areas. So it's in all these areas, not just one. Issue three, changing water flows affect, affect our freshwater. So we've got to do some work. And I just hope that as councillors, when we do these debates, that we don't, def you know, forget you know, that, that shadow that's hanging over us and that we actually do something about it. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I've got Alexa, then Michael Deaker. 
had actually spoken, but I would just like to add that we can't be held back by our lack of understanding. And I think that's a really important thing. And we need to operate from a systemic relational approach, which I think this, this paper is telling us that. And so is the series of papers that are coming under that Aotearoa 2020, the, uh, 2019, uh, that whole approach. And this government's taking that approach. And I think it's right for us to. And of course, we have to continue collecting data, lots and lots of all the useful data we can get our hands on that instructs action. But let's not just wait. That's the worst thing we can do. Thanks, Alexa. And Michael Deacon? Yeah, thanks, Mary. And it's a question to probably Sarah or Gwyneth, because uh, it's higher level stuff. Uh, is there any relationship between this paper we're talking about and the next one on the Three Waters investigation? Uh, is it just coincidence that they're side by side on the agenda? Or is this a sign of some joined up thinking either by our ELT or by the government? <laughs> um, I'll answer that, Michael. It, it is a, co a coincidence. The, the next paper we're about to discuss was meant to come to a previous meeting in, in March. <laughs> but you were right in the sense that there, um, there is a change of foot um, from a whole na a number of angles for national government around uh, water generally. Um, and so I think that's probably just a reflection of that. that. I just also wanted to quickly add, um, Rachel's been texting me, we now have Jason from the science team, but um, if you want a comparison in terms of Otago um, and some of the numbers in this report, look at the LAWA website. Okay, thank you. I've, I've just sort of got, got a comment. I really appreciated this. Um, I'm obviously, well, like others, councillors, I'm privy to stuff that comes in to, um, in fact, there's a meeting starting in about 10 minutes from all the regional councils who are kind of waiting as we wait for the fresh water NES to come through and, and are comparing the data and having those sorts of conversations. Um, the only thing I'd say to us as Otago that, that I do know is that we are really behind the eight ball on, on water work. Um, we, we haven't, we've, we've so always delayed until we get everything perfect or total agreement that we are right behind where we ought to be. So I really welcome this, this report. Can I have a mover and a seconder for the two recommendations that we, the council receives the report and the council notes that our publication, our Freshwater 2020, will form part of the suite of publications that informs policy development and plan making particularly in respect of the revised regional policy statement and the proposed land and water regional plan. Happy to. Who was a happy to? Kate? And okay. can I have a seconder? Alexa, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 And against? Aye. Carried. And uh, last... Madam Chair, can, can um, I just ask a question? Oh, sorry. Um, this report is, is, you know, will it be communicated to the public so that yes, they can actually... It's on the MFE website. The full okay, report. but who looks on the MFE website? Well, I, I just it it came out on the in, in our one of our press releases. Yeah, I know, but I'm just saying if people if people are all on the same page, it'll make your job easier. Okay, that's all. Yeah, I accept that. Yeah. Marion, could you could you just unmute? It's Hillary here. Could you just unmute Michael Laws? I haven't got him muted. Well, he says it's muted well, from the hour up there. Just I've so just as we can vote. I don't, so I've uh, been muted for the last half hour. I didn't do it, promise. Hello? Okay, we're up to three waters investigation. Well, what I'm, I, oh, sorry, I was going to speak on that because... So what are you going I've to been muted for the last hour, for the last half hour. So when I joined, I haven't been able to contribute to this debate at all. But... Um, I was actually going to, on that issue, um, if you go to page 76 of that report. Which the, issue? The issue to, which issue? Well, I'm, I think you've just passed it, have you? You've just passed the issue of um, Freshwater 2020. Yeah, but just, okay, so go back onto that. What is it you want to say? I, all, all, I, all I wanted to say was, um, I, I, I always get worried when bureaucrats want to act on their gut feeling, but B, um, <laughs> the thing oh. that... Uh, the, the thing that most most worries me here is that we do have a role 
which I think we're passing over today. Um, and the questions that we should be asking ourselves are where are the information gaps that we've got in Otago? Um, how can we plug them? And what resources do we require to do so? Now, those sorts of issues seem to be fundamental to me to the annual plan. But before we start, you know, turning around and saying, oh, gosh, woe is us, I think this behoves us, this Freshwater 2020 report, to answer those questions ourselves. The science is missing. It's missing in Otago as well. We can't wait for the government to ride to the rescue. We've got to do that to ourselves. And so I'd like those three questions addressed. Where are the information and science gaps in Otago? How can we plug them, i.e. the ORC, and what resources do we require to do so? If we're just going to adopt, look at this report and bang it up somewhere on a website, that would seem to me to be a betrayal of what the report's there for. Um, first of all, Michael, it isn't our report. It is a, No, it, I know that. Okay. So um, it is a report from the Ministry for the Environment, and it's already up on their websites. Um, yep. But secondly, the three questions you asked, which were related to our doing our science, I thought some of that was particularly covered in the paper that we debated parts of in the last and the second item of the agenda, but Sarah, if you'd like to respond, please. Um, all right, so just thinking about this in a holistic way, uh, you'll recall, uh, some of you may, that we made uh, extensive increases in our State of the Environment Monitoring Network uh, in the last financial year. So uh, we are in a much better position than we were previously. Um, we are also in the process of uh, assessing the science needs for each FMU and so as part of that we will be in a much better position to be able to understand where we have other gaps that haven't been identified. Um, you'll also recall that we had the skeleton report uh, and in that that addressed uh, our science team and our lack of science resources and those resources have been <laughs> excuse me, um, in some part, um, recognize, um, inc basically increased um, in the last financial year. And we also have plans uh, in this annual plan for further staff increases to allow that additional science to be done. Um, so that's, that's kind of at a high level. Um, I think we are progressing quickly and uh, in a way that's very positive moving forward. Uh, but certainly we have had a history of perhaps not being able to do as much science as we needed to do. Is that answered, Michael? Thank no? you. Okay, can we go now to the last item on the agenda, which is Three Waters Investigation. And we are four motions here, they're all noting motions. Um, but who is the person responsible for this? Anne Duncan, where are you, Anne? No, I'll speak to this, it's fine. Who's speaking? Gwyneth, Gwyneth I'll speak Gwyneth, to this. Love. Uh, I, this is, um, I guess this is a paper, um, you know, probably 95% 90, of which is um, being taken to all TAs um, as well as ORC as participants in this work. So this is a paper you um, would have gone to all um, a number of councils. They're at various stages given COVID in terms of bringing the paper to the, the councils. And it's just to make you aware of some work that is occurring and an application for funding to do some work around Three Waters in Otago and Southland um, and how it's um, options for how it's delivered in the future. A question, Marion. I uh, will start with a comment. Uh, one, I think this is brilliant. Um, I, it's great to see uh, sort of a, uh, a very joined up approach across the two regions in the south but i'd like to know from gwyneth and from sarah what are the advantages of doing it this way what, what outcomes are going to be achieved through this um, ta regional combine that would have been less likely to have been achieved otherwise well i guess um I guess, Michael, from my, my personal experience in terms of sitting in, in the workshops is that it's formed a group of 
um, senior people across councils that are now discussing three waters. Um, they discuss it quite an open debates are happening in terms of issues um, at the very and that sharing of knowledge is occurring and it's um, actually quite an enjoyable um, constructive environment that we're working in. That in itself is an, I think it's an outcome. Um, but I guess uh, as the paper indicates, um, there has been, I guess, a nominal timeline given to um, different uh, to the councils to come up with a way that they think to best deliver um, three waters for their region. And it gives us the opportunity to think about what's specific to Otago and potentially Southland as well, um, and what we might need as a region rather than having a, um, I guess, a cookie cutter approach um, from central government um, being imposed um, as could be the potential. Can I just check a question, which is, oh, sorry, Kate. Can I just check a question? This, um, we've just appointed, not we, the government has just appointed a freshwater person, you know, from um, Canterbury, what's the name? Bill Bayfield. Yeah. And the rumours I hear amongst regional, other regional council chairs, is that they're very nervous that there are probably only going to be three or four right throughout New Zealand groups. So we might be in a group that is larger than just working with Southland. Is that correct? Are those rumours, uh, are those, am I right? Those rumours exist, don't they? Uh, yeah, right. rum, yeah rumours do exist. Um, um, and some of that is, uh, I guess, uh, based on information the government has previously presented, uh, for, for instance, at the local government NZ conference, I think it was the year before last, in terms of their thinking um, going forward. So there is there is discussion, previous discussion, and I guess this is this is an opportunity that um, is being presented for councils to drive the process um, from the um, from the regions rather than a, a top down approach from the central government. Um, and so some, but some of that um, previous information that's been presented is still circulating. It talks about much larger right. uh, regional so bodies. I, just so if that happened, the work we're currently doing wouldn't be wasted, would it? I, I don't think so. So I think in two fronts, again, as I said, in terms of a group of um, people that are now collectively talking in very open discussion um, regionally and coming up with a, a cohesive narrative for the, the region, both Otago and Southland, the region, that I would see that as definitely inputting into a bigger in, um, a bigger body if that occurred, um, say it went further north, basically, and we had the likes of Can Canterbury or West Coast also joining the group. Mm. Thank you. Um, okay. just Sorry, I was just going to say just to help, there were some maps that were presented at the Local Government New Zealand Conference in 2018 uh, that showed those bigger areas. Um, any of you who had that information might have, might be aware of that. Thanks, Steve. Kate, you did. Can I ask a question? Who's had a question? Michael. Uh, Michael, Moore. Did, Michael did Kate, did you have a um, question? Yeah, I did have a question. Um, I'm, I'm interested in this and I know that there's some work done under section 17 for the shared governance stuff in the past on some of these topics or touching on some of this. Um, at, at what stage or are you considering this to be a technical group with no governance oversight as it goes ahead or are you expecting some governance oversight at some stage? It's feeding up through the mayoral forum. So. Okay. Mayoral forum. Okay, Michael Laws. Um, yes, well, that was the question I was sort of going to ask, and it was the, the TAs is really where the rubber hits the road with three waters. They are the ones that are going to be putting up the huge amounts of money and are, in many cases, behind the eight ball. Um, are, we, are, they, are they part of this as well? Yes. So um, the, the working groups are, I guess, either group managers or people like myself in terms of uh, the regional councils. Um, and that's the working group, but it, this is being uh, put together at the request of the other, and maybe Marion or Sarah can talk to this, the mayoral forum who have two priorities, which is around water and waste. And this is driven out of the discussions around water um, and particularly three waters. And that's what led to the working group being formed to look at this work. Yeah. So are they part of it or not? The TAs, yes. So the TAs obviously are, in, are linked in at the mayoral forum level, but they're also um, members of the working group of, from every TA and regional council, both being Otago and Southland. Michael, one, from one of the things that 
on my weekly meeting with the other TA, with the mayoral forum in here, is that they are nervous because if, if this gets removed from them, the power over this, it's a third of their work and a third of their income and a third of their expenditure. And they're, they're asking themselves questions like, <clears throat> if we don't have, you know, oomph, and this gets taken away to somebody in Wellington or whatever, uh, if we don't have control over this, then um, uh, we face the problem that um, how relevant are we in local democracy? <laughs> On the other side, the other people are saying, the people who are dreaming this up, that this, uh, this three waters work together is because too often at local council yes. level, people have argued we won't put up the rates and therefore haven't had enough in the, in the rate box, in their finances, to actually do the three waters work they should be doing. And we have at least three TAs in our area that fit that description. Yes, Mary, and I, 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 I well understand that, and I think that's a point well made. Thank you. Brian? Um, just like um, previous speakers, I, I really support, you know, this, any work that's going on, and I would hope that progress reports would come to this council, not just to the Mayor's Forum, because we're part mm -hmm. of this equation, whether we like it or not. We're the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Look at recently with Clutha, previously with QLDC in Central Otago. When there's regulatory issues, then then we're involved. And and this is the opportunity to have a proactive involvement. And and I like that the fact that they're working together. There can be funding opportunities, design opportunities. The reality is, is that we need to have done better than we have in the past. Thanks, dear. I see Gretchen stand up. Yeah, just wanted to say that I do hope that this um, leads to further accountability rather than being um, a lot more talking between a lot more bodies. Um, yeah, I agree that we've stepped away from um, uh, where communities need us to be, I think, um, in terms of we're a long, long way behind our communities and what they want to invest in, I think. And um, yeah, we've got to catch up and I fully support the Regional Council putting some money into that. We do have a strong role. We need to ensure that stormwater and wastewater <laughs> catches up the 20 odd years that we've mucked around essentially, particularly in Otago, I think. Uh, we do have a bit of a, nat a national reputation, actually, of leaving this, thing, this on and not getting on to it. So um, I'd like this to lead to accountability. And that's not in all TAs, but yes, um, stormwater particularly is a difficult one, but it is one we're behind on. Uh, wastewater as well, as we've already touched on. Drinking water is partly us as well, um, with our water plan and the land water interface. We're in there too. So um, yeah, let's put, uh, let's get in there, let's support it. But I guess it's a challenge for you, Marion, involved in that mayoral forum to make sure it's not another talk fest and does lead to accountability. And I'm sure you'll do that. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Gretchen. I was, I was going to call on Hillary then, Kate, just before I do. Gretchen, I think that the work it's talking at the mayoral forum, but the work is done, being done really well by the staff at the moment. Hilary. No, I was just agreeing with Gretchen. Okay, thank you, dear. Uh, Kate. Um, I'm really happy with this. I also would know that there's some councillors on this committee who've many years experience, I'm thinking of Andrew and Alexa on as infrastructure councillors um, that I'm sure could offer if there were any need to have any assistance at that level. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm just wondering structure-wise, and we've talked about mana to mana a number of times today, um, where Ewe sit on this technical group, because it's certainly an issue that I think they have a lot of um, interest in. So I know, um, I'm just going to have to try and find the right paragraph. I know um, there are discussions. Um, and okay, so sure. if I missed it, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, sorry, I have to find the right paper. I know we're at, you've got to remember this paper was prepared a little bit earlier. I know where the discussion's at and 
I don't know if Edward has any more insight in terms of those discussions. Oh, it's uh, 18, paragraph 18 has one line saying Mana Fena will also be involved throughout the process, but is that how light touch it is? Uh, ah. we, we are, we've got staff directly involved with councils. We've been on a workshop, I think it was, it was at the ORC on Three Waters. Um, we we're aware of it and uh, the need to be engaged. But uh, yeah, more work to come. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Kate. So the recommendation is that the council notes that the chief executives from Otago and Southland councils have applied for Crown funding to investigate notes that the Otago Regionals Council's contribution is estimated to be 18,750. Note that the proposed investigation is a form of, a, of an indicative business case. And then for you, Brian, notes that once the indicative business case is completed, it'll be brought back to councils for information and to consider potential next steps. Thank you. Can I have a mover for all four, please? Kate, and a seconder. Brian, did I see your hand up? I did. Can we take them all together? Yes. All those in mm -hmm. favour of this, please say aye. 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 And against? Are there anyone against? I declare it carries. I also declare the meeting closed. Oh, before I declare the meeting closed, we are seeking advice from local government New Zealand to interpret 10 people in a room for council meetings. Okay, because we have more than 10 people. We have 12 plus all our people. So we're going to get this some clarity from local government New Zealand for that, uh, for our next council meeting, which is two weeks today. Okay, I will keep you posted on that as soon as I can. What's and happening hearings? Sorry, dear, Kate. Hearings, so for next week. Our hearings will be conducted online. Yes, they'll be on Zoom. They'll be on Zoom. All right. Any other issues? There isn't. Bye bye, people. Thank you. 410.